Hello, this is saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is a conversation in jazz, where we are promoting jazz through telling the stories. Today, our guest is one of the hardest working musicians in jazz. He is a trombonist, educator, producer, composer, and band leader. He has a music ministry of love, peace, and social justice. Please welcome my brother, Mr. Reginald Sinchi. We ask you to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so we can let you know when we are posting another video or going live. We also ask you to donate to our Cash App in order to support the channel and help us to produce future videos. Our Cash App is dollar sign jazzology 101 that's dollar sign jazzology 101 enjoy the video hi this is saxophonist antonio parker and this is a conversation in jazz today we have one of the hardest working musicians in jazz he is a trombonist educator producer composer, and band leader. He hails from the Virgin Islands, and he has a music ministry of love, peace, and social justice. Please welcome my good brother, the one and only Mr. Reginald Sinchi. <laughs> How you doing, good brother? I'm good, man. How you doing? Oh, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir, man. Uh, we go back um, yeah, some years, man. Years, yeah. 27 years? 20-something. I, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it was like... 1997. Yeah, yeah, 1997. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. But uh, man, I didn't watch your ascent. I say. <laughs> and uh, you're doing great things. And you know, I want to learn a, a little bit more about you. Okay. Some some things I may not know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my first question uh, is, who is Reginald Sinchi? Ah, well, I guess um, I'm this person from the Caribbean. You know. I <laughs> You know, all my family is from all over the Caribbean. As you know, as I started researching my family tree, uh, my grandfather's from Curacao. Wow. Um, my my mother's folks is from Guadeloupe. Oh wow. My mother was born in the island of Guadeloupe and and, and raised in, in Dominica. Uh -huh. um, my father's mother, uh, my grandmother, is from the British Virgin Islands. Wow. You know, so it's like you know when I start looking as as family in Cuba. So I'm I'm from all over the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah. From all over the place. From I, all over the Caribbean. That's a beautiful yeah. thing, man. Yeah. So where were you born and raised? So I was born in the island of Dominica um, and raised in the Virgin Islands. The island of Dominica? Mm-hmm. Is that close to the... How, is that different? No, that's like in the... Uh, that's like um, uh, one of the southern islands. Oh, you know? wow. So like if you think of like Trinidad, Tobago, okay. St. Lucia, you oh, know, wow. St. Martin, Guadalupe. It's right next door to Guadalupe, okay. Dominica. Yeah. So did your parents... But, uh, moving around? No, uh, my parents actually met in St. Thomas. Okay. Um, and then my mom, after she got pregnant, she left St. Thomas to go back to Dominique to help out some family there. Okay. And while she was there, I was born. Okay. Yeah. And so then you went back to... Yeah, so I was like, probably about six months later, we went back to... My mom went back to St. Thomas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So is, is that the same time, uh, St. Thomas that uh, uh, the iconic saxophonist Sonny Rollins... Uh, composed, wrote yes. a song. That's about. correct. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. So it's actually St. Thomas is kind of like a, a old quail bay tune. Uh -huh. as a, that's the official music of the Virgin Islands. So um, his mom was singing him this melody, right? And uh -huh. so he used that melody to kind of create St. Really? Thomas. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, so is that song, is that song popular over there? Um, I, It's Amongst the jazz musicians, all the calypso musicians, um, the younger musicians listen to a different type of calypso now. Right? Okay. But um, it's uh, it's one of the, you know, if you're looking at a, a, a standard in the Caribbean, well, not in the Caribbean, in the Virgin Islands, that would be mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. Okay. So what was it like coming up, man, in the Virgin Islands? Hmm. Um, it was great. I, that uh, My father played a lot of Bob Marley records, and um, there was music everywhere. So... Like if you could picture like being on a Caribbean island and then you seeing you hearing like a, a small band playing uh -huh. almost like a trio, mm -hmm. maybe steel pan, bass and drums, or you might hear another band with a flute, or you might hear like a large calypso band with a bunch of horns. Yeah. So growing up, I heard a lot of music, 
Um, and in fact, the way I got into music was that I was in the sixth grade and I saw this, this older kid demonstrating a trombone. I didn't know what it was called at the time, but I was like, man, that, int that instrument looked in interesting. Wow. Yeah. So, but what was it like in terms of the social, can, can, uh, family, communal? Mm -hmm. what, sure. what was it like? Um, well, I, have, I'm, I come from a really big family. So, um, especially on my mom's side, when I was growing up, we, um, you know, my mom actually played a critical role in bringing up a lot of my family from Dominica. Okay. So her brothers and sisters would come and stay with us, okay. get themselves situated, and then become part of the community. Um, so she, even though she's like, you know, kind of like the middle child, she was she's like one of the pivotal figures within her family. Gotcha. Um, and so I, you know, I was around family, and then um, as far as the community, uh, when I got into music, the community is really supportive. So it's like, mm -hmm. whereas here you, you find stuff is like really spread out because it's like a small town, yeah, yeah. but like a small, um, it's almost like a small New York. If oh, you, wow. if you, if you, was like, there a lot of love? Yeah, there was a lot of love. I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, as with human beings, there'll be other stuff as well, but yeah. there was a lot of love, a lot of support, um, you know, where you know you, you knew your neighbors. Yeah. Um, you know, because I came from a large family, if I went to a certain area, someone would say, hey man, don't mess with that kid because that's such and such nephew or that's such and okay. such cousin, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was I was just going to ask you, is it the kind of place where you, somebody might knock you on the head, <laughs> over the head? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's some of that, you know what I mean? But it was different for me growing up. I mean, for me growing up, we had like this thing in our community, in, in my neighborhood, where um, it was an unofficial like, um, fighting rank, right? Mm -hmm. So like like say we'll have like these little wrestles or, 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 uh -huh. or, or stuff in the neighborhood and then you knew in the neighborhood, oh man, that cat, you know, there was yeah. this cat named Randy that was like really yeah. good with his hands. And this yeah. other cat named Jimmy that was really yeah. good at yeah, wrestling, yeah, 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 yeah. right? And so it's like you, you they would, that would kind of like curb some of the, the, yeah. the fighting because you knew like yeah. where you where you yeah, ranked within yeah, the community, yeah. and then and then you know so then we rolled to the basketball court or yeah, hung out, yeah. but we we you like oh man Randy was like yeah, yeah. one of the best fighters in the neighborhood kind of yeah. thing, um, and then it changed over time for some other. I remember reasons. coming up in Philly, man, and you know, um, and, and and we had even you had people who had were like uh, like popular for mm -hmm. certain things. Somebody could dance, mm -hmm. somebody can sing, mm -hmm. uh, somebody could play music, somebody was good with the girls, you know, <laughs> somebody could fight. Mm -hmm. Y'all had that kind of thing? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. My, my uncle... Um, uh, well, Celeb it was like community celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle was actually like one of those cats that like, so when like say hip hop cats came to visit the island, uh -huh. he would be the background dancer, Oh wow. right? So my uncle was like, uh, um, First he was into break dancing, and so I was like, man, I need to check this out. So I started out break dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, he got into hip hop dancing. So I was like, yeah, man, I need to get into that. Wow. So it's like actually growing up, I had like these two different lives. I had one life that was playing the instrument, another life that was like into <laughs> hip hop dancing. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's cool, man. And uh, what was the uh what was uh how did coming up in the Virgin Islands impact your worldview? Hmm. Um I think for me, what it did, I think one of the biggest things for me was uh, growing up in a black community, right? Okay. It's, it's, that's basically what it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so you saw people in powerful positions, people at the, the, the you know, um, homeless, people who were middle class, mostly um, of African descent. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, it, I never really developed this thing of like, I'm less than in a in a community, gotcha. or you know, or that you know. What I mean, there was there was there was elements of like there's this area in the island that was uh, they used to be um, that had like a, a population of um, some Caucasians um, in the called Red Hook on the island, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes there might be a vibe there, but it was never a vibe that well I felt like I had to watch my back. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Coming from a community where it was mostly black. Mm -hmm. And then you had these folks um, of um, in different positions. And so what, the way that helped me was that um, the way I looked at the world was through those lens. Gotcha. Like, um, we are the majority on this planet. Um, there's no reason I should, like, walk around in fear of someone else, mm -hmm. you know? Beautiful. Now, for those of us who may not know, what are the Virgin Islands? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, it's just like it's it's part of the um the dealing with the the history of of this planet. I mean, you if you think about the United States being a young country, and before that, the the they used to be the Danish West Indies, mm-hmm. right? And so by them being the Danish West Indies, there was like this prime real estate within the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. I mean, there have been different owners, you know, before the Danish, you know, you, of course you had the the the, the, the indigenous people mm-hmm. there before that, right? And so because of the slave trade and European um, countries trying to, you know, dominate the planet, um, at one point in time, the United States wanted to find a strategic uh, post. Mm-hmm. So the, the United States was like, look, I'm going to purchase these islands from the Danes. Okay. And so they did. And it became the U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the story's a lot longer than that, but that's a yeah, yeah that's a cool. short version. What is is it? Quelby music. Yeah, Quelby music. Quelby. Yeah. What mm-hmm. is Quelby music? Quelby music is really Bambula music um, mm-hmm. after the Bambula King. And so basically, if you look at it, it's like if you think about what happened in New Orleans, mm-hmm. right? It's the same that happened within the Caribbean. So, for example, in Jamaica, you have mental music mm-hmm. that uh, it sounds similar to Calypso. Mm-hmm. And that mental music was the, the basically the Africans bringing their music and being in a similar climate that they were able to make similar instruments, mm. right? And then that music is going to change eventually and become reggae, right? But yeah. first, it sounded like West African music, yeah. right? So, in the Virgin Islands, Quilbe music was originally called Bambula music and so you have this clash of these two cultures the african culture and then the 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 oppressing european culture um and these cultures clashing and the, from that clash creates this was music known as quill bay but it was actually called bamboo after the bamboo king wow. there's actually a dance etc mm-hmm. but then the virgin Islands decided to call it quill bay because of the quadrille and some other french influences etc um but before that um the Africans refer to their music as bambula music. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, like, what, what, how do you develop that accent? Like, <laughs> is this something that you just heard? I you, mean, it's, is, it's the same thing as the as the music. I mean, if you think about um, um, as as um, you have this crash of these these clash of these two cultures, mm-hmm. right? And because um, the drums were not taken away because mm-hmm. the environment was so similar. Many of the folks in the Caribbean maintained the African dialect. Okay. And so, um, uh, in fact, if I was speaking with folks from the Caribbean, my center structures would change mm-hmm. because I would then put emphasis on certain words. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it's 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 a, a way of holding on to cultural heritage, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And remembering, but not really knowing mm-hmm. that you're remembering, mm-hmm. but then speaking a, a, a language to be able to communicate out of necessity. Okay. And that creates a, the accent. Wow. Yeah. You still got it, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, I, I, you know, there's some folks from the, from the, um, from where I grew up that, 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 that feel that it's necessary for them to lose the accent. To so, lose it? Yes, yeah, so they can be accepted or, wow. For to you know for different reasons, folks have their different. I think reasons. it's cool, man. But I think that cultural heritage is very important. Yeah. So I I made a conscious choice not okay for it to, for it to not to disappear to be able to communicate clearly yeah in different situations, but make sure that the accent is yeah. still there. You know. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, have you have your kids gone to the Virgin Islands? Yeah, yeah. they've been they've yeah. been there, um, and you know yeah. they love the you know. They love going the, back. Yeah, yeah you know, they, they love the beach. Yeah. They the love family, the family, everything. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you come up? You mentioned something. You know, some of your family was in music. Well, you, did you come up in a musical family? Not really. Um, you know, it was kind of strange. I mean, it's like as I grew older, I learned about family members that dabbled in music, mm-hmm. um, but not necessarily where you know, you know, you go by over by somebody else, and everyone is music is everywhere. Everybody's playing an instrument, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, you yeah. know. Or you go with you know the father and son is heading to the jam session kind of thing. Gotcha. It wasn't that kind of thing. But music um, was in the community. Music was in the community. Yeah. Yes. Um, was and, it an important part of the community? You uh, know, like yes. Uh, so, like for example, like uh, the 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 holiday songs are queer based songs, okay. and they have these interesting chord changes, right? Mm-hmm. And these melodies that that outline the changes in a certain mm-hmm. way. That's dealing with the rhythmic nature of the music. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you so like a lot of the 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 pop the the folk songs within the Virgin Islands are based on this 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 Quill mm -hmm. music. So hearing that in, in itself and yeah. um, was a uh, uh, was important. And also there's an element of improvisation within uh, Quill So sometimes you hear with some of the the traditional Quill bands they'll play the melody. Right, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a section where you might have flute taking a solo over the changes. Oh, wow. okay. Right, yeah. so it's like it's kind of it's a similar yeah. thing to to, jazz. to to jazz thing here. Wow. Yeah, you have you have siblings, right? I know you have yeah, two yeah. sisters, three sisters, three, three sisters. Yeah, three. And you're the oldest. I'm the oldest. Yeah. What is it like being? I'm, I'm the oldest, so, <laughs> but, so we know what it's like. But what is it? What was it like being the oldest? Um, Did you I think have, that look out for the sisters. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so like, I can't. What what happened with me? And I and I always uh, always talk about this is that. Um, you kind of adjust as they get older. So when they were real little, it was kind of like, all right, I'm the big brother, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and when they first started having boyfriends, like, you know, I'm the big brother. <laughs> but then as they got older, it was like, okay, adjusting to this, yeah. this new situation and mm -hmm. then deciding how I'll be the older sibling or just be the sibling yeah. as they mm -hmm. get older, you know? So now I'm just, I'm just a sibling. Just <laughs> it's, it's cool, you know, yeah. I just, I just and, 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 you know, and if a question is asked, cool, yeah. you know. If not, that's cool too. Okay. You know. Yeah. <laughs> did they look up to you? They look up to you. Like I think when we were, I think when we were kids, uh -huh. um, they did. I think now we just we look at each other as as adults. You know. Okay. Um, and um, you know, there've been times where we've had discussions, but I've tried not to, to come at the discussion as I'm the older sibling, so you yeah, need to listen yeah. to what I say. It's more like okay. Well, have you considered this? Have you considered that kind of thing? You know. So you miss. You mentioned that your father mm -hmm. would be checking out uh, 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 Bob Marley. Yeah. That kind of music. Mm -hmm. And so you heard a lot of that around the house. I did. I mean, my. You know, well, like, like all the pictures. My my parents were like for a little bit, like kind of like into the Black Power thing okay. for a little while because the 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 governor, um, Cyril E. King, he was. Um, one of the one of the influential governors within mm -hmm. the history of the Virgin Islands, and so my parents were like a part of that. Okay. Um, and then um, growing up, you know, that Bob Marley being played in the house, even my father didn't like outwardly say mm -hmm. certain things. Just the Bob Marley and the yeah. song, the messages yeah. in the songs were like part of my childhood. Wow. And then being in a in a community where the Rastafarian community is 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 such a integral element like even wow. if you you're not a Rastafarian there's certain things that you do and say yeah. that's similar to that Rastafarian culture and so it's like you have this other element of wow. this you know um, not only just social justice but really this consciousness yeah. that's part okay. of the community yeah. okay now what was your first instrument um my first instrument I would say is the trombone but I but my father got a a, a, um, a piano for my uncle, an electric piano, nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. And he brought it home and he, he he knew some little songs when he took piano lessons mm -hmm. as a kid. So he would like pluck up some songs at the piano, I'll watch him and then I'll, you know, play Lena, me and the piano, <laughs> right? Yeah. Nothing serious. Yeah. I, I didn't get really serious about music until I actually picked up the trombone, you know? Wow. You know so so uh, did you choose the trombone or did the trombone choose you? It was kind of a combination of both because, like I said, when I was in the, in the sixth grade, I saw this older kid demonstrating a trombone. I didn't know what it was at the time. And then my cousin started playing trombone in elementary school, right? And then shortly after that, I noticed that my, my neighbor, uh, this guy named Chip, he passed away some years ago, he was playing trombone. And his older brother played trombone in, in one of the Calypso bands. So I started seeing the trombone everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so my parents, um, we, we first lived on one side of the island and then we moved to another side of the island. Mm -hmm. And because of zoning, when I graduated from sixth grade, I mm -hmm. was supposed to go to one um, junior high, but I ended up going to another junior high because, you know, zip code, et cetera. And so when I got to the, the new junior high, I um, saw my schedule band. So when I got to band, we learned about music theory and then it came time for us to pick our instruments. And I decided to pick the trombone for two reasons. One, because I kept seeing it everywhere. And then two, no one else was picking a trombone. Wow. You know, so I wanted to be different. Okay. You know? wow. So that's how it started. <laughs> that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you, you started music in school. Yep. Was that your formal training? 
Yep, you were learning. You were learning how to read music, mm -hmm. and and uh, and that sort of thing, yeah, right there. Right there. Right there. Okay. Did you develop an immediate passion? Yeah, for I th it? I think so. Like um, I did I, when I picked up the saxophone. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> it was an immediate passion, but it was it was kind of like this condition, and it was the community, the fact that you you can see in the clips of bands. It's mm -hmm. not the same now, but as a kid, the popular songs in the community with these calypso bands with horns, yeah. trombone, saxophone, trumpet. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see, you can, some of the pop popular songs require a certain amount of skill to be able to play them. Mm -hmm. So little kids learning instruments, they will try to play the calypso songs and right away they're doing things that challenge them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then also in my band class, we had a listening day every Friday. So every Friday my band um, <clears throat> director would play, um, Mozart, we'll play some Miles Davis, we'll play some funk. So mm -hmm. every day we'll have a listening day. We're there doing our homework, but we're hearing this music. And so that listening day also helped wow. feed that passion. Wow. Yeah. So did did music, learning music, did it come easy for you? I don't think it was, I don't think I was one of those, you know, sometimes some of my early students would say I was a, a prodigy, but I don't think so because I what, what happened is there was students that were able to do things that I couldn't do on the trombone. But I think I had a great work ethic, you okay. know? And so I remember when I went to this summer band program, after my seventh grade year of, of first learning how to play the instrument, my band director said, you should go to this summer band program. So I went mm -hmm. to the summer band program, and there was this other cat there. He, man, he could do lip slurs, no problem. I was like, mm -hmm. man, that's how that come easy <laughs> to you, right? And so I met this, um, uh, my first private instructor, and so he was a trombone instructor at this summer band program. And he saw that I was serious, so he made a deal up. I didn't know about the deal. So he told my parents that, you know, um, he would love to work with me, give mm -hmm. me private lessons. And here's the deal. If I show up to lessons prepared every Saturday, lessons are free. If I don't show up prepared, then they'll start charging. <laughs> and he start charging. My parents never had to pay any money. Wow. And I didn't know about the deal. I was just like, yeah, I'm ready to learn. <laughs> wow. You know? Yeah. And so, so, yeah, so I was always like serious so about learning. Who was his name? Dr. Trotman. Dr. Trapman. Dr. Trapman, yeah. yeah. Trapman? Trapman. Trapman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to give him some love. Oh, yeah, man. Dr. Trapman's a, yeah. a great. He, so, my he, first band director was Mr. Ari Ari. And uh, then, um, and then you know, Mr. Ari Ari uh, uh, suggested that I, I um, go to the summer band program and I met Dr. Trapman. Um, was he the, did he, was he the uh, educator that had the most profound impact on you? He was one In of them. Developing? He was one of them. I okay. think. Trombone playing, he had the most impact on me. Um, uh, Mr. Ari Ari had a lot of impact on me as far as that listening day concept and mm -hmm. that, you know, teaching. And and, and it's kind of his pro approach to teaching was a little unconventional, you know what I mean? Um, you know, sometimes it's funny and it's something you, do, you hear folks make these jokes, but, you know, he was one of the band teachers that he wasn't afraid to tussle with students, you know what I mean? Because yeah. there were some students that were knuckleheads yeah, and yeah. they were... Um, like this eight graders are yeah, big. Yeah. I mean, they're big now, like, you know? Yeah. And, you know, um, or, you know, students coming from different backgrounds and homes, you know, he would speak with them in a way that he would reach them mm -hmm. and get them to see that this music thing can save their life. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And so um, he was influential in that way. Dr. Trapman was influential in a way of, of just showing me the possibilities in a trombone and that, mm -hmm. you know, with consistent practice, sound, uh, intonation, lip yeah, slurs, yeah. flexibility, that kind of stuff. Um, he was impactful in that way. And then he also later on would, would you know, help, would help me with some opportunities yeah. as well. That's one thing I dig about you, man. You, you, I, I've always known you to have a strong work ethic. Where, you, where, where, where'd you get that from? I think I got it from, I mean, just my, my family, you know, mm -hmm. my, my, my father worked, uh -huh. you know, you know my, my parents probably now be considered the working poor, Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. My father worked, my mom worked hard. Um, mm -hmm. My mom started off as a maid mm -hmm. um, in the hotel industry and then worked her way up to being the manager of housekeeping. Wow. You know, um, my father worked hard. Not only did he work at the local um, PBS station, he also went around and fixed televisions and radios for different folks. So he was like, you know, a repair man. So he's like, he had the one main job and another job. You know, yeah. so I've always seen folks work hard, you know, yeah. so, you know, it was, 
Beautiful. I know some people make jokes about folks from the Caribbean, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw them work hard, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, your parents still around? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. are they proud of you? I, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I, I think so. I, I think you know when I, I think that period of time from high school going into college, there was almost like this fear of like, you know, yeah. is music the right thing? <laughs> you know, and I, and and I've, you know. Those folks who know me for a long time know that I've worked my way up the ladder. You know what I mean? It was no like nepotism kind of thing. You know, and it was like taking this up the ladder yeah. one step at a time. Yeah. And so I think when I was going up the ladder, they were like, oh, I don't know about this music thing. Kinda, <laughs> you know? But they've always they've they've recognized that I, I really love music, yeah. you know. And 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 I think now that they they can see yeah, the yeah. whole thing, yeah. they're like, oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Well, you're one of those guys, man, that would have probably been great in any field you've gone well, thank to. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I remember you were, uh, when when the, uh, we were just getting into internet, you, mm -hmm. used to, you, you taught yourself code. Yes, that's right. And that's it, right. <laughs> you did my website. You that's, did right. Web <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I said, this cat, man. You, so you always had that kind of mind, man, that, uh, that, uh, uh, really focused, man, you know. And I, you know, I try to take a little bit from everybody. Mm -hmm. I try to take a little <laughs> bit of that from you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah. Do you remember um, when you first heard jazz? Yeah, it was in that seventh grade class. It really? was in yeah. It was um, it was a combination of a couple of things. So it was in Mr. Ari's listening day uh, uh, music uh, band class, and it was also um, one of my one of my uh, uh, friends for a long for a long period of time. I mean Gums, mm -hmm. who played drums on the first four albums. Mm. Um, we we were in seventh grade together. In fact, Amin was like uh, ahead of me musically, right? Yeah. So it was like he was like a, a, a kid in inspiration, like seeing all these young serious musicians. Yeah. Like his father's a musician, yeah. his his cousin is Ruben Rogers, mm -hmm. you know. So it's mm -hmm. like all this music in the family. So he was like playing at a young age, and so seeing that it was like, wow, man, that's that's crazy. <laughs> this cat, yeah. You know, and there was this other cat in the community, Gil. Gil, Gil Gilchrist Sproul, mm -hmm. you know, piano player, vocalist, also um, ahead of me. So, you know, they probably like, they're probably, you know, like Gilchrist is probably like three three years older, probably. Um, and there was this other cat named Neville Peters, mm -hmm. um, 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 brilliant pianist, um, um, blind musician. But he was all of these cats that were a little ahead of me, except for, I mean, I mean, and I are the same age. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was cats ahead of me that were real serious. So that also, was yeah. part of the, the the nurturing by seeing these real serious kids playing mm -hmm. music, and we're all on this small little island, you wow. know. Um, so, but when you heard jazz, um, and and mm -hmm. I know you were listening. Y'all, you said when y'all was listening, y'all were listening to like different yep. types of music. Mm -hmm. Did jazz stick out in in any way compared to the other musics? Yes, it did because it it there's something that was that was freeing about the music, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and I remember when I mean, gave me this Miles Davis tape. I don't remember the album, but I remember it was a Miles Davis mm -hmm. tape. And it was just something that was just freeing about the music, you know? And in fact, when I came to the music, I came to the music as a way of where I wasn't even really focused on the structure of the music. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to, to deal with that, that, that freeing feeling, yeah. you know, away from playing the concertos of just being able to be free to yeah. create. Mm -hmm. And I think one, that's one of the things I enjoyed about the music at first, yeah. that freeing feeling. So, you know, uh, I, we, we both educators, but I find with young people sometimes, you know, you, you, with this generation or, or the, with the young folk, we have to like sell them jazz. <laughs> you got to explain it. Mm. Did, did you have to, did, did someone have to do that for you? Or no. It was just, wow, like that wow factor. Mm -hmm. And I, I I often wonder, man, um, because jazz is competing, not I ain't, uh, competing mm -hmm. with all these other different hip hop and all these other forms. And so a lot of times, very few young folk get that wow mm -hmm. factor. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and as an educator, I've been in schools where they brought jazz in the schools. We've done some stuff mm -hmm. like that too. And a lot of times we, you know, we go and we try to explain <laughs> the blues, mm -hmm. you know, one, four, five. We try to explain call and response and all that. But I had this idea, man, of just bringing like a cat like Raw Hog Groove mm -hmm. and just do a concert and hit. Bang. Yeah. 
and let them get the wow factor. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I first heard jazz, it was a wow factor. I was at a Settlement Music School in Philly, and I heard this sound coming from the basement, and it was uh, uh, Love and Hines, it was Joey DeFrancesco, young mm -hmm. Joey DeFrancesco, Robert Lanham, and all these cats, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lewis Taylor and Leonard Richardson, all these cats, man, and, and uh, uh, it was a wow factor for me. And uh, you had that wow factor. Yeah. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, you know, you know, wow. So, I, cause I, I, I try to figure out, well, how can we get these young folks? Uh, uh, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. I yeah. think um, when, when I look at myself, I think for me, the fact that I had Quill Bear music, right? So this Bambula music that had mm -hmm. an element of improvisation mm -hmm. that I was hearing it within the community, um, that was that was almost my mm -hmm. pivot to jazz. Like mm -hmm. it's like I'm already familiar with someone playing a melody and then soloing, mm -hmm. right? And if you think of like you know some R and B songs of the 1980s, on there's that element as well where you have someone singing and then you might have someone take a solo. It might be a piano solo, it might be a saxophone, a guitar solo, right? Mm -hmm. And this is music that folks are playing in their house, so you're hearing that that can be someone's pivot. I think that the, the challenge the challenge for some students is that they don't have that pivot. You know what I mean? Their yeah. music that they listen to, this that 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 element doesn't exist. Wow. And so it, it might it might create be able to create something that that allows them to pivot to the music so they can have that wild thing. Yeah. You know? Wow. You yeah. Know. Now, was there a particular artists that really impacted you to, and to say, I want to do jazz? Um, or, not at or, first. I think it was kind of like gradual. So it was like first enjoying the music, like just like I said, I really love this music. And then after that, it was the, 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 the learning of the figures within the community. So there was this, um, this elder musician, um, Joe Ramsey, that was performing all the time. Um, there was, uh, um, at the university, there was this, uh, the, the instructor, Martin Lampkin, and I was, you know, he would be out at some of the clubs and then seeing them perform. There was this, uh, this, um, uh, um, this, this cat from St. Croix that was playing. It was all these different musicians that you would, you would hear them at in passing or you would see them at, at, at something and it would just be like, this music and say so it was just first the local cats, the cats yeah. that were that were playing around town, that was the that was it for me. Yeah. I that's didn't know about the it, national, uh, yeah. international cats. Yeah. I just knew about these cats that was around the town yeah. that was just yeah. playing. And those cats, Got, you know, yeah. drew me in closer. Yeah. Gotcha. You know? So now Ron Blake, saxophone is Ron mm -hmm. Blake. He's from the Virgin Islands, yes. right? Yes. Sir. Did you know him? I in? yes, so I met Ron and Dion. Um a little later in my development, I think I was probably in the ninth or tenth grade. Okay. And at that time, I still wasn't like board feet in yet, yeah. right? And was he so, was he in high school at the, at the same time? Or was he? No, he was. He, Ron he was, and Deanna older than me. Yeah. Okay. School. Yeah. So. Yeah, he's part of my generation, right? Uh, probably. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um. I'm not sure Ron's exact age, yeah. but I know they're they're older than me. Yeah. Um. So they will come back. So this is the other thing. They they came back and they would do workshops, right? Okay, wow. And so one of the things I remember, he came. They came back and they did this workshop on tetrachords, right? The first four notes in the scale, next four notes, etc. And then um, I remember somebody had identified me as 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 someone that's getting ready to go into jazz, mm -hmm. and they were doing this performance at at uh, this 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 outside mm -hmm. venue called Tilly Gardens, mm -hmm. and they invited me to come play. And they played How High the Moon or something, and I had no idea what was going on <laughs> with the harmony. You know, but I, you know, I did what, you know. Yeah. Um, but that situation made me want to, because I knew enough to know that I didn't know what was going on, and that made me want to learn what wow. was going on, yeah. right? And so by, so I remember that I'm coming back at that time, um, and hearing them play, and then um, uh, later on, there was you know there have been like different points in time where 
I've encountered them or been mentored by them or shared the stage with them that, you yeah. know, that helped my development. And, and Ryan is such a cool, nice yeah. cat, man. Very, mm -hmm. I know he was very supportive. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What about Ruben Rogers? Ruben is probably like two or three years older than me. Okay. So Ruben was, when I was probably a freshman, he was probably a junior or senior. Okay. In high school, so y'all went to the same school? No, he was he was at a different high school. Okay. Um, so, but did you know him coming up? Yes, we. I I I um, I eventually met Ruben through his cousin. I mean, okay. Um, and I, you know, and then, you know, when I when I started, like I, I think it was a fourteen or fifteen, when I was like really wanted to check out this thing, my father would take me to some of these jazz clubs, and um, you know, he would either drop me out because the the older cats would be like, oh yeah, I'll take him home. Mm -hmm. Or he would stay there with me. Um, and I remember, you know, Ruben playing with many of those bands. You know yeah. what I mean? He was playing bass with, with yeah, many of the, yeah, um, yeah. the, like this cat named Lewis Taylor. Mm -hmm. He would have, you know, Lewis Taylor trio and Ruben would be playing bass. Yeah. Um, he would, or he'd be playing bass with Joe Ramsey, you know, so. And then sometimes Amin would be in the gigs. You okay. know? So like Amin and Ruben, they were already doing gigs in wow. high school. And so I was like, I was I was learning as yeah. they were already out there doing things. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I think are there any other cats uh, from the Virgin Islands that we should know about that uh that Yeah, there are plenty. I mean yeah. there um this Rashawn Ross, he plays with uh Dave Masters band, mm -hmm. um, of course Dion Parson, Ruben Rogers, there's some other there's some younger cats, you know, Victor Provost has been mentoring these young steel pan players. Yeah. yeah. Um I can't think of everyone's name yeah, off my head, yeah, but there's, you know, there's, you know, there's, it's, it's a small community, but it, within that small community, it's very supportive. So, like when I was growing up, the musicians in the community that saw that I was serious, they kind of like surround you and wow, nurture you. Beautiful. You know, it's like, hey, you know, yeah. All right, you trying to play music? All right, you should go and play with a university band, ninth mm -hmm. grade, so you can play, read some of those charts. Wow. You should play with a university jazz ensemble, mm -hmm. so you can read some of those charts. So it's like it was this this situation where it wasn't always about money. It was about just nurturing, yeah. you know, or, or you know, you serious. You need to come up to the gig and yeah. hang, yeah. you know. And I I remember this cat named Mr. John Stone. I would ask him to show me some voices in the piano, and he would show me some voices. And sometimes I'll go um, to these uh, these uh, um, performances. I remember one time we were on break, and I was playing the chord changes to one of the tunes. And Joe Ramsey, the saxophone player, um, elder in the community, he turned to me and said, that sounds good. You just need to make those voices or those changes in your horn. And it's like, that's all he said, right? And so mm -hmm. I was like, then I like, planted a scene. I was like, okay, I need to figure out how to really deal with what's happening here harmonically that yeah. I'm learning about these voices and how can I get, outline those things on the okay. horn. You gotcha. know? So. so did you have a particular practice regimen? I did. I did. Yes, I did. I um so after so when I met Dr. Trotman the summer of seventh grade and I started studying with him eighth grade, I re right away I noticed the benefit of practicing. So when I first started, so I was in beginning band in seventh grade and then, mm. you know, moved me up to advanced band in eighth grade. And I was last chair, you know, you know, this chair thing. Mm -hmm. So I was last chair in advanced band when I got there. And so the kids were like, man, who's this kid playing? You know, because that band's <laughs> band cats have been yeah. playing since elementary school. They've been friends, et cetera. And so they saw that every week I was moving up. Wow. Until I was sitting <laughs> right next to the first trombone player. Wow. So it's like this focus thing, I would see the rewards of it, you know, just yeah. just growth. Um, and so right away it was like the consistency of practicing, you know, the the fundamental stuff working on, you know, a piece, a prepared piece, working on music. And then um, um, when time got a little crazy in high school, um, it was the idea of get to school in the morning, with school bus to drop us up at 6.30 in the morning, I would practice in the morning, do long tones, whatever. Mm -hmm. So students are socializing, I'm practicing <laughs> outside the, the band, band room, outside just, you know, playing. And then after that, Lunchtime, folks are socializing. I'm in the band room <laughs> practicing. After school, waiting for the bus, probably no practicing. Then when I got got home, practicing. In fact, <laughs> now to this day, my neighbors always, you know, my parents where I grew up, they always know when I'm back because they hear the horn. <laughs> right 
<laughs> and if you and you and if you think about it too, it's like that neighborhood was like really supportive. No one like came up to my parents. I was like, ah oh, yeah, man, yeah. you practice and you need to stop. You still practice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and and that and, and that's the thing is like when I was growing up, I can't remember a neighbor coming up to my parents' house complaining about me wow. practicing. And wow. that the horn is loud. Yeah, yeah. You think about doing long tones and lip slurs yeah. and playing concertos yeah, and blah yeah. blah blah. No one in the neighborhood, wow, and the houses are close together. No one came and complained. So it's like it was what just that was a support, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, just not complaining and just be like yeah. encouraging. Wow, you know? do you still have the same passion and joy? Yeah, that you had it yeah. right now, yeah. you had as a kid. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, because I think one of the things I discovered about music it was like this in some ways, an instant gratification. Yeah, I remember as a kid as you know kids deal with all these different things right mm -hmm. and i remember as a kid that i didn't really have stress because i always had this outlet yes. right i could go and yeah. just play music and then for some way that was like therapy that was like yeah. the, the release no the doubt. you know putting it in the horn and putting it in the music and then yeah. being able to be calm and cool you know so how'd you how did you eventually um develop the ability to improvise Hmm. And play those changes. <laughs> uh, it was a it was a process. It was it was kind of like reach to a certain place, and then hit a wall, and then like how do I get past that wall? Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing for me was um, the 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 desire to want to be free, right? Mm -hmm. And then remember, we we when I came back, I was, as a kid after my sophomore year of high school, I went off to interlocking for that summer. Um, and I learned a little bit more about jazz theory and a little bit more about, you know, playing concertos and orchestral excerpts. And I came back and, then, you know, I noticed that the other high school, they had a jazz combo. So I approached, you know, my, um, some, some of the folks at the school and said, you know, why not, why, why not have a jazz combo here? Mm -hmm. We have some of the students that are interested. Let's do a jazz combo. And then my science teacher, who was my anatomy and physiology teacher, mm -hmm. He was a jazz vocalist. Wow. He would be singing in the club. So he, he came by, heard us practicing, and he was, became the vocalist for the group. Wow. Um, and so in that situation, it was, you know, over some of the tunes, they had similar, like for example, Autumn Leaves had a similar, <laughs> you know, harmonic thing. It was in, you could kind of stay in, in, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. area uh, and it'd be cool. Um, and then, uh, so all through, uh, my junior year and, and senior high school, it was that way of improvisation, right? Mm -hmm. Just just listening to the music, but not transcribing. Mm -hmm. You know, having transcription, playing along with transcriptions, but not actually learning yeah. the stuff myself. Yeah. And so when I um, so I would meet different people, and 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 the the beautiful beautiful thing about that, and going out to these jam sessions is that there were certain things I was developing naturally from doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of learning the music through, here's what you play over this 251, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. here's this chord and this is what you do, mm -hmm. there was, it was kind of like this discovery thing yeah. that was happening that, that benefited me in some ways. Yeah. And then um, I would meet different players and hear them talk about stuff, so I would start working more, de dealing with more details. And then when I went to Boston, I remember saying to Ruben, I was like, man, why do all these cats sound Why'd you this? go to Boston? I wanted to play music. I wanted to play jazz, you oh, know? You went to, was that Berkeley? Yeah, it was Berkeley. Okay, yeah. okay. You know, so it's like, I, um, you know, if, in fact, you know, my, my private instructor probably preferred I, I, I'd audition for, because I was, I was prepped for doing concertos, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. I was like, if that was a path, it would have been no problem. <laughs> the, 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 probably the struggle would have been a little different. Uh -huh. Um, but I was like, no, nah, I want to play jazz. <laughs> so anyway, I got to Berkeley and I, um, I, uh, I, well, before I got to Berkeley, I, I played for the St. Croix Jazz Festival. And that was actually one of my first music business things. I, um, I was, you know, in high school and the, the cat was recommending me for this, mm -hmm. this, this performance. And, uh, I got, I got in a gig and. We did. It was all these cats, man. All the cats from the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. cats that were that was that been to the Virgin Islands or out there playing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm playing with all these great musicians on this gig. And um, at the end, after we did the gig for the Saint Croix Jazz Festival, you know, 
big thing. It was like, oh man, I'm in high school playing with all these killing cats. <laughs> and after the, we did the gig, at the end of the evening, everyone else got paid, except me. <laughs> my first, my first lesson in music business. I was like, what? <laughs> And when I told other cats about it, it's like, nah, man, you should whatever. Yeah, man, the cat paid everyone else. They didn't pay me. Wow. I did the rehearsals, blah, 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 etc. Wow, that's cool. He didn't even give me like a, you know, a student thing. It was like, okay, you I'm paying everybody. You dinner, man. You know, everybody, <laughs> everyone has going to get $500, you get $250. That, yeah. It wasn't that, it was like, wow. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. That's it. So you were gigging in high school? I was, yeah, I started doing some gigs. My, you okay. know, my private instructor would hook me up with stuff. Okay. You know, seventy-five dollar gig yeah, there, hundred dollar yeah, gig yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. Mostly like you know, church gigs <laughs> with the trombone choir. Wow. You know. So when did you start transcribing? Because I know you at some yeah, point you did a lot of. I, yeah, I, I, it was gradual. It was kind of like, you know, you know, sometimes you have musicians be like, oh man, I don't want to sound like anybody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it was first. It started with like learning solos, being able to sing along with solos. Mm -hmm. And I think that was important. And then after that, it was, it was a desire to then want to really understand what's going on. And that was kind of like a gradual process. It wasn't, it didn't happen right away. It was, again, it was like, I, I can sing along with the solos and I can play some things on the horn from the solos, but I hit a wall. And then a desire to want to learn more then led me to really dig deeper and so it was like a gradual process. I think the 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 um, the first uh, thing that happened to me that really sent me um, in, into like this deep shed was I was at Berkeley, and I remember this cat, this cat named um, uh, Garrett Perkins, saxophone player from California. We were good friends, and he, he, we were in the practice room one time, and he was like, did you hear that E-flat 7, flat 9? That flat 9 is important. I was like, okay. And so that night I kind of, you know, paying attention to details. And then um, then a, some other thing happened. I, was, I went in my first day at Berkeley. I went to this practice room, and there was these two killing trombone players. One was Elliot Mason, and one was, I forgot the name of this cat from Australia. Mm -hmm. And they were playing all over the horn. And I had no idea what they were doing, but the desire to want to figure it out forced me to do something that that folks kind of consider some things that I do in the trombone now, because mm. it was like, how do I figure out what they're doing, but I don't understand what's going on. And so in that trying to discover what they were doing kind of got me doing some things in the trombone that I do naturally now, wow. right? And then it was then it was like trying to find. Then I took this trombone survey class with Tony Lada, and then we was talking about different trombone players, and mm -hmm. it's like deep more transcribing. And then um, uh, you know there was it, it was like a, a process. I mean, up until you know two thousand one, I think was this this is when I re really got deep into transcribing. It was like this process of like, a little bit of transcribing, more, 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 until it was like crazy, like yeah. transcribe some trumpets, some saxophone, yeah. Yeah. blah, blah, blah. That's why I said, you, I remember you trans yeah. transcribing Kenny Gare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so it was, yeah. It, was it, it was a process. It didn't just happen, it wasn't, it didn't start automatically. It was, it was kind of like, once I discovered something, it was like, oh man. Yeah. And it gets easier, does it? Yeah, it gets the, yeah. it gets easier, yeah. and and I think that that process of first learning how to sing along with the yeah. solos was it's like, good. yeah, yeah, this is this is yeah. connection, yeah, yeah, you know, and and it became easier. In fact, it was it was funny at that one of this um, one summer, I think I was hearing this this Slat Hampton solo over and over and over. Something about the solo I really loved. I was mm -hmm. like, and I was just singing it in a car, drive, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I was like, I need to go learn this solo. And the process was so easy. Wow. After listening to it over and over, and, and I was like, it, yeah, 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 you know. Um, and so, you know, I even tell students, that's like, just play it until you can sing along with the solo, then learn it on your instrument. Wow. You know? yeah. I'm mad. I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, do you remember, now, were you, inf were you impacted by, uh, that period I call the Young Lions period when Roy, because I came up through the, mm. uh, during that period, uh, I was in, I was a part of it. You mm -hmm. know, Christian McBride, Joey, uh, 
Roy, mm-hmm. Joshua, mm-hmm. The, you know that, that period. Uh, that was a that was a beautiful period. It was like the really coming out of Winton, Winton and Bradford. Mm-hmm. Really, they kind of you know from that's what we were checking out, like mm-hmm. black codes and, mm-hmm. and that. were you. Did you get some of that, or did that come before you? Uh, that that came before me, but the Roy the Roy period I think happened at, when I was like you know, a, a freshman, you know, sophomore in college, those, those first early years, so 17, 18, 19, mm-hmm. around that time. I think for me, one of the things I, I, I loved about that period was just the black representation. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? As a as a young black kid, seeing you know black mm-hmm. men, black women. Um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it playing was, music, it was like, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? That, yeah, it, it, you know, I mean, if you even think about the impact of Winton winning a Grammy for yeah, a classical yeah, album yeah, and a jazz album, yeah, you know, yeah. um, you remember that, right? Yeah, 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 you know, I mean, you just you just hear people talking about that yeah, as yeah. a kid, um, and I think that that stuff is important. Um, and but for me, I, I remember we would we had these these listening sessions mm-hmm. as uh, when I was a freshman in college where we would sit down and listen to music. Mm-hmm. And, of, you know, I remember Roy's Tokyo sessions. Yeah. Folks going crazy over that. <laughs> um, I remember when, you know, um, there was this... Uh, uh, Tim Warfield's cousin was at, at Berkeley. I forgot his name, man. Uh, was drum... Not, uh... The tenor player. I don't, I don't uh, you know, know. he you know, would say, "Yeah, man, I'm not telling you, I'm, 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 I'm Tim Wolfie's cousin." But anyway, yeah, we there was this beginning of this album with this killing bass line. It was a song like, you know, it's like when you're the young lions, you yeah. know, Roy and others. Yeah. There was all be this element of hip hop in yeah. there, yeah, like, yeah. like some kind of like funky yeah, yeah. bass line <laughs> thing before them they start yeah, swinging. Yeah, yeah. And so all of that stuff I love, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we would kind of try to. Do that thing, and then we would like, we would sometimes be at this spot called Wally's in in Boston, uh-huh. and we were sitting down and just be singing solos as they're playing over the, you know, because yeah. they're playing jazz yeah. in the club and so stuff. Come on, and we just yeah. singing along with yeah, the solos. Tim, you know, Tim Warfield told me he used to do that. Sing, he mm-hmm. could sing the solos. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we, you know, we yeah. sitting down and you know, or the or, or uh, at 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 time before I even if it was coming out on the horn, we'll take Charn Scat singing. Wow. You know. That's cool. Wow. So, so you went to Berkeley right out of high school? I did, yes. So, I didn't stay, but yeah. I, I went there. So what made, I met you when you came to the DMV. Mm-hmm. What, was that after Berkeley? That was after Berkeley, So yeah. what made you come to the DMV? Oh, man. I mean, it, it was, um, I visited, first I came to the D.C. area in 1993 as mm-hmm. part of what's called a Marching 100 for Clinton inaugural okay. um, mm-hmm. inauguration. And so when I came up here, um, as, as, as a senior in high school, it was like a joint thing with the two high schools, which was great because, you know, there sometimes can be a rivalry between high schools. But we, we came together for this one thing, and we came up here, and I loved the area. And then I visited D.C. in 1997, early 97, like um, February 97. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, this is similar to home. Well, you know, at yeah. the time, it was like, I'm seeing black folks in in, 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 yeah. in, in powerful positions. I'm seeing mm-hmm. them in different walks of life, yeah. similar to home. I didn't see that in Boston. And even when I was in New York briefly, I didn't see that in New York. But there's something about DC that was like, this is similar to home. And I think that's important. You got a little piece of the chocolate city. I mean, it was, it was nice. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was, it, and I think that's important because, you know, when we talk about all, you know, all the elements of society, being able to see that, right, and experience that mm-hmm. and just see Black folks just living life. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this is cool. This is yeah. nice. I like, you know. So you decided to leave Berkeley? And yes. Come to, and so, we- yeah, I, you know, it was kind of crazy. I mean, when I was at, um, when I was at an, in, in Boston, um, you know, I was like, you know, and this, 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 I, I, I didn't see the value in it anymore. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to leave school. Wow. I'm going to leave school. You I'm told performing. your parents that. And I told, I told my father, I said this, you know. And actually, when I was in the ninth grade, I experienced my first hurricane. In fact, it was in 1989. And the schools, similar to the pandemic, but with destruction, yeah. right? So the schools shut down, no communication. Um, um, and that was like my first. And I got to high school. And then it was like, oh, can't do nothing. Hurricane mm-hmm. hit the island. Everything shut down, right? 
Um, our home was partially destroyed. And so fast forward to um, Boston, I was like, you know what? I don't know if this thing is gonna work out for me. So I decided to leave school for a-, a, a You didn't a, like Berkeley? I didn't, I just didn't like the environment. Okay. I loved the music, but I didn't, there was okay. some elements about, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. talk about yeah. all the, the craziness in Boston. There was some elements about about it, about Boston I didn't dig. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, you know what? This, I'm gonna just go do this music thing. So I had this brilliant idea of going back to St. Thomas and, and, and teaching music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of reasons for that. And so when I got back, I started teaching lessons. Um, and I was planning to like build a, build a studio mm -hmm. and just you know work with students and mm -hmm. help them grow. Um, and then Hurricane Maryland hit. Wow. And then shut down everything. So, um, so after Hurricane Maryland hit, I decided that I was gonna, um, that's when the first time I moved to New York. Okay. Um, and then I was in New York uh, searching for a job. It's like, oh man, let me try to see if I could find a job. <laughs> and so there was this cat I knew from Boston that was like, there's a school up in Yonkers that's hiring. Mm -hmm. It's like, cool, I'm gonna go check them out. Mm -hmm. So um, my uncle, uh, he passed away now, but he would show me like, you know, New York City is, is kind of like, you know, you could see the map of New York City just by the subway system, mm -hmm. right? So this, anywhere you want to go, you can get there. So Yonkers was outside of that system, you needed to catch a bus. So I remember catching a bus to go teach at the school, well, go audition slash, you know, interview. And I got up there, and when I got to Yonkers, the, there was a miscommunication between myself and the bus driver that I only had like a certain amount of money in me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the bus driver was like, oh, well, you know, you have to take this bus. So I ended up taking some extra buses and spending more money I that I intended on spending. Uh -huh. I got there, did the interview, and the interview went well. I had enough money to get back to the beginning of New York City, which was like all the way night by the border of Yonkers, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So when I got back, I ended up walking from that part of New York City all the way back to my uncle's, just following the map. Wow. And that day it rained, it started, it first started drizzling. <laughs> I had a coat, had a little tiny little umbrella. And then the rain picked up and then I got soaked because the wind said, bump your umbrella, man. So why didn't you just ask somebody for a couple of dollars? Hey man, I was just, I was just walking, you know? Wow, did you have your horn? No, not at okay. all. Yeah, okay. you know, um, but I, you know, I got soaking wet. And how long yeah. was that walk? Probably hours, man. Hours. You know? <laughs> wow. Hours. Yeah. Damn. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, my 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 first time in New York, I spent the niche that that whole time just trying to find employment. Wow. Yeah. So were you were you hanging out on the scene? Not the first time. Okay. Not that's that was what ninety five. I wasn't. I so was what made you come to the DMV? So so I'm getting there. So okay. So I got, got to New York, um, then I went back um, to, to uh, St. Thomas, um, uh, got married, and then um, was looking for a place to move to. And then I remembered from 93 that it was cool, so visited, uh, before get, getting married, I visited the DMV in 97, and then decided to locate here. Okay. In, in um, middle of 97, what was that? July 97. Wow. wow. Yeah. And that's when I met you cats. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask you, man, what was your impression um, when you got here ah. in 97? Like, because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you really didn't know the music scene ah, at the time. I, the, it, was, it was great because the I think the, the, the beautiful thing about the D.C. area, and it can be, some folks can take advantage of it, is that it's like a welcoming city. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's like you, go, you if you go to a, a black church and someone gets up yeah. and they try their best, it's like, good <laughs> yeah, job, yeah, man, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, um, and so when, when I got to the D.C. area, like, everyone was, like, open. Even if yeah. I was an outsider, like, yeah, I wasn't, yeah. like, I didn't grow up here, I didn't yeah, have yeah. friends, yeah. Or, you know what I mean? It was yeah. like, hey, man, you, you serious about playing music? Yeah. And so um, that became another, that another yeah. like, you know, if you think of, like, different periods of learning, that yeah. became another period of learning. Wow. You know, who were some uh, of the first musicians you met? Ah, uh, yourself, Davante McCoy, 
mm-hmm. um, Alan Johnson, mm-hmm. um, Michael Thomas, mm-hmm. uh, Kenny Rittenhouse. Yeah. In fact, Kenny gave me my first gig in DC. Really? Yeah, wow. in 1997 at One Step Down. We met the twins. Uh-huh. And then I got my first gig. Was, was that the twins on Colorado? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, met, I, I met Craig around that time too, Craig Austin, mm-hmm. but I didn't see him that often. But as far as the cats that I would see uh, regularly was yourself, Don Vante, um, um, Raymond Angry. Yeah. Um, Alan, you know, yeah. Jamal, Jamal Brown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. The, yeah, yeah. we used to go out to the, to the jam session mm-hmm. and do. Um, yeah, so. Uh, uh, you also joined the army, baby. Army yeah, band, right? yeah. So, was that when you got to DC? Well, so when I when I got to DC, um, after my initial, t- I, you know, it was like okay, I left school and I, I I'm when I got to DC, I'm getting, I'm getting ready to start my my um, get back into school kind of mm-hmm. thing. So I was uh, what 21 at the time, you know, and. There was something in me that was like, I need to figure out how to do this. And so I, um, I, you know, I run that time. I, I came, I was working at the Holiday Inn. That was one of my first jobs mm-hmm. um, in DC. So I was working at the Holiday Inn while I'm coming out to the jam sessions, mm-hmm. right? And then practicing, et cetera. Um, and I, I uh, went out to Howard and then, you know, check it out, check out the stuff. Um, and I was like, okay this might be a cool vibe for me mm-hmm. to, you know, finish up my degree here. And so I um, I started in the in 1998. Well, 1997 into 98, I started playing with a band, even if I wasn't with, in school. With the high university jazz yeah, ensemble, mm-hmm. okay. So I started playing with a band, the, the not only the jazz ensemble, but also the concert band. Okay. And... Um, I wanted to figure out a way to pay for school. So I had a friend that I met that was from St. Croix. We didn't know each other in the Virgin Islands, but he was from the Virgin Islands, but mm-hmm. from the other island, St. Croix, the larger island. And so I was like, man, how are you paying for school? He was like, well, I'm in the National Guard. I was like, oh, okay. So how does that work? <laughs> yeah. So he, 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 you know, he walked me through the thing. I was like, okay. Um, you know, and I, at this time I was becoming aware of my parents, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, you know, yeah. their hard work and et cetera. Yeah. And I was like, and that was one of the reasons, because I, one of the reasons I left Berkeley too is that the student loans for me to go to, like I had, I got money to go to school, but mm-hmm. it wasn't a full scholarship. Mm-hmm. So the student loans, I became aware of that. Yeah. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense, because yeah. if I, once I graduate, I'm going to leave with this huge yeah. amount of money yeah. that yeah. I owe. Um, and there was other ways I could have worked it out, but you know, yeah. young and, and, and trying yeah. to figure out stuff, I made that decision. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, how can I pay for school and not have to deal with these things? Mm-hmm. Um, and so he walked me through the process. So I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna join the National Guard. And so I joined the National Guard, but it was one, it was one thing. And, and this created a, a, a problem at, at, at Howard because there was like, okay, if you go to basic training, you have two options. You can either go um, in the summer, which you're gonna miss the fall semester, or you can go in the sp- in, in the in the in the in the spring, which you of course miss the spring semester, right? So it's like either way, mm-hmm. I needed to. If I once I start, I'm not gonna be able to just go all the way through. Mm-hmm. But you know, I signed up, and lo and behold, mm-hmm. that first semester, they took care of it. Right. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I don't have to <laughs> yeah. fulfill my end yeah. of the bargain. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I, I um, you know, before so the 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 the, um, the spring of, of, of ninety eight, I traveled with the bands. I went on tour with the concert band, and I went on um, um, tour with the jazz ensemble. Mm-hmm. And then that summer I was in school. I mean, not that summer. That fall I was in school. But then that following year, I had to go to basic training. So okay. that's all, yeah. So that's how I joined. I first joined the National Guard. Okay. Being active duty, that's another reason why I became active duty in yeah. 2005. Okay. Yeah. And um, so did you, you left Howard after, after that? So, yeah. So after that um, period, um, when I, um, that first 
semester went well. Then the next semester, I was um, I was at basic training, and then it was just a process. And then I eventually came back to Howard. Um, what was the semester? So ninety eight. Then I came back in two thousand. Okay. Two thousand two thousand one. Um, uh, and then again in 2005. But you didn't finish at Howard, did you? Mm -mm, no. So why'd you leave Howard? And why'd you so it was a, it was a, it was, you know, uh, so. In, did you have your kids at this time? Not, not until okay. 2005. Okay. So actually the kids are the reason why I went active duty. Okay. Right. So in 2000, in, let's see here, 2000, 2001, I was working and going to school. I was working, first I was working at Target and going to school, then I was working at, um, at, uh, at, um, um, what was that spot? Borders, mm -hmm. going to school. And uh, it was like, those going back and forth between these things yeah. were, 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 were challenging and then dealing with some other things as well. Um, because at, around that time, um, for my first marriage, I was going through a divorce, mm -hmm. right? And so 2000, 2001, those semesters were, were like in and out between working and, and, yeah. and all this other stuff going on. And then um, there, was, uh, there was this thing that happened in 2001, dealing with this gig, I, was, I, 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 I did a self-produced concert and somehow the money got funny mm -hmm. at the end of the night. And I was like, you know what? This is crazy. And I decided to move to New York. Okay. So I went the to New York. Second, New York the second, second time. time. And so okay. New York the second time was the was crazy transcribing. Were you hanging on the scene? I was hanging on the scene, meeting the cats. In fact, when I got there, I got a gig. Right after getting there, I got a gig with Illinois Jaquette's band. Oh, wow. So I yeah. met all these cats, and yeah. then that's why I met Sean Jones and mm -hmm. Julius and some other cats. And then Sean and I used to play this part called the North Star Cafe with mm -hmm. Jared Gold and sometimes Jerome Jennings. So I was just there, just and Sean was checking out Woody Shaw. So I started checking out some Woody Shaw. So I was crazy transcribing at that time. Uh -huh. That was like full-fledged transcribing, listening, studying. Um, and then I... I I, I saw, uh, somehow I was, I was, I was hanging with Rashawn, the same cat I was telling you about. We was walk, we was making our Basis. runs. No, um, trumpet player. Okay. So I, Rashawn, I was going around the scene and um, uh, we, we get to the blue note and John is playing drums, John Lampkin. He was like, oh man, I'm playing drums with, uh, with you, know, I, you know, I want you to meet somebody. Mm -hmm. so I haven't seen John since, since uh, I think Berkeley at mm -hmm. this time. I think, if I remember clearly, because um, of course he's in the area, right? Yeah. But I think that time when I saw him in New York, I think that was the last time I saw him was in mm -hmm. was in Boston. Um, which yeah, I remember to tell you a funny Roy story after this. Um, so anyway, we um, he's at the club and he was like, I want you to meet somebody. So. He takes me upstairs and he introduces me to Steve Torre. Wow. So I was like, oh, you know, you know, I've heard, you know, I really enjoy your music, et cetera. And he, Steve Torre was like, oh, I've heard about you. And it turned out that the cat from the Virgin Islands, Martin Lampkin, John Lampkin's uncle. Wow. Right? The, he was a, a, the teacher, trombone teacher at the University of the Virgin Islands, told Steve Torre that I'm, I'll be in New York. Wow. So look out for me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm meeting Steve Torrey with John introducing me to Steve Torrey. <laughs> wow. And his uncle told him about told him, yeah. told him. So he was like, you know, why don't you come by the house? Wow. So um, this also is going to like crazy, crazy transcribing. So I, I meet Steve Torrey. We, 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 um, we exchange information and I go by his house. I'm at his house for 12 hours. The really? lesson starts... I don't know, somewhere in the afternoon, I don't leave there until like one, two o'clock in the morning. We're talking about slide technique. We're talking about his approach to harmony. We're watching videos and different trombone and their slide technique. We're listed to different types of trombone players from wow. folks who are avant-garde to folks who are all the way into funk trombone yeah, yeah. players. 
Um, so that first lesson is like 12 hours. The next lesson is me hanging out with him in the city where we're going out different things, different places. And then one of the spots we stop at is 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 at, at this club where um, Fred Wesley is playing. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time I hear Fred Wesley's interesting articulation playing jazz. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I've heard him play <laughs> funk and yeah. I never heard him play like over wow. changes. And I'm like, oh, this sounds interesting. Yeah. You know, and he's like hipping me to all of this stuff. And never charged me for a lesson. Wow. But the first lesson, I told him that he was asking me what I want to work on. And he was like, I was told him, well, you know, I want to work on my articulation. He was like, yeah, you know, why don't you work on this thing? So um, before moving to New York, you know, the condo I had in Sterling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, sold the condo, moved to New York, mm -hmm. used some of that money as living expenses. Mm -hmm. And, um, so where you know, I was like, you know, how much, you know, whatever, I don't have much, but he was like, buy dinner or whatever. But um, after that first lesson, and he gave me some pointers, went to St. Thomas for about a month and just transcribed Clifford Brown solos the whole month, just working on the articulation stuff we spoke about. Came back, uh, met, uh, I think at a, right, right before that trip as well, I met Vincent Gardner. And he came by the house, by the apartment, and he was telling me some stuff that hooked up his plane. He was telling me that he, he transcribed this solo by Cannibal Adderley over Green Dolphin Street. And the way Cannibal played over that really, you know, yeah. changes his, his playing. So he said that, you know, sometimes when you transcribe different solos, there might be one solo that will like change your playing. Yeah. So just listen for that. Um, and then, and that period of time is when I met Eric Lewis. He used to play at- um, Elu? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, and yeah. so he used to play at um, Cleopatra Needle, so mm -hmm. I would go by there mm -hmm. on Monday nights. And I remember I was like trying to figure out a way to play with him until one evening we went to um, this diner after after Cleo, mm -hmm. Cleo, uh, Cleo's, and I was listening to him talk. And it's like from listening to him talk um, uh, is when I learned like how to like interact because it's like sometimes someone's personality comes out in the way they speak. And so I was like, oh, that's yeah. this, this is this cat's approach. Yeah. Um, and so that that whole period was just meeting cats and playing with cats and transcribing and, you know, hey man, yeah. what album should I be getting? Gotcha. You know, yeah. we'll spend all this money and yeah. CDs at yeah, a yeah, store, yeah. come yeah. back and track, you know what I mean? That was, yeah. that was a vibe. And then my old roommate from Boston, Lawrence Clark, we would sometimes go around to all yeah. of these cats, just, it was kind of a similar community kind of thing of like, so Northern. why'd you leave that New York and come back to DC? <laughs> so um, after being in New York for a little while, um, you know, the money that used that got from the condo, it was it was there was there was a, a series of things. One, there was some shady landlords, had a nice um, apartment, but it was some shady landlord stuff. There was the the funds, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, because if you know, having these gigs they weren't enough to sustain, yeah. right? And then it was, it was. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be living a rough life. I wasn't living a rough life yeah. in New York, but I didn't want to be living a rough life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I saw some cats were living, so I decided to come back and commute. Okay, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Back and forth, and I was still playing. I still had the gigs. Yeah, I still yeah, knew, had the yeah. connections. So I tried that for a while. And That's why I call I, you the hardest working man. And in then the after a while, it was like. <laughs> This is this is difficult, you know what yeah. I mean? Just tr taking Route One up or taking you know ninety five yeah. or whatever, yeah. just going up back and forth to New York. It was like really challenging for a while, and I was like, you know, I just I had a convers I had a very important conversation with Noise Jaquette. He was like, man, I don't uh -huh. want you to Noise Jaquette before okay. he passed away, and I was like, you know, this is hard, and he said. Uh, in fact, we would have these rehearsals and his. Um, yeah, I did. I played. I did. You know, long rehearsals. You know, you know that right. being rice yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's like yeah. all these. So anyway, we, we, we you yeah. know, he's like, man, you're driving back and forth to come up to do these rehearsals and driving back and forth to come up to these gigs. I was like, yeah. He's like, man, you know, I know too many musicians that's, you know, had mm -hmm. accidents in the road, this, that, and mm -hmm. the other. I, 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 I can't. With good contest, I can't see you doing that. Why don't you consider not traveling back and forth like that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. See if you could find another way because that road thing, yeah, that's not healthy, yeah. you know. And I was like, you know what, right? 
mm-hmm. you know. And then, um, and so, but that was like like a university thing. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, so that was the that was the, that was my second time in New York. Yeah, know? so so you made decision the decision to come back to to just stay at the. In, yeah, in the I really liked the area, and uh, the New York. I didn't like it for living. I loved it for the arts, yeah. and I was, you know, I was, I was on the, I was on the trajectory of, yeah. of moving forward with the thing. But, um, yeah. you know, once I, I, I decided to come back and commute, it was like, I was like, nah, this is not making any okay. sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love it. I would go. I was still, you know, I, you know, I love. I, I really love. Like, I remember one time we had a gig at Delta's. And I call this cat to do the gig. He's like, oh man, sorry, man. I can't make it. But it's 15 cats that are killing that can do the gig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all of them are professional. All yeah, of them yeah, will, yeah. will learn the music. All of them yeah. will show up ready. You know, that was great. But just that that quality of living just did not yeah, gel yeah, for me. Yeah. And I wasn't willing to like, yeah. you know, yeah. mess with that, that yeah. thing. So let's talk about in DC. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about the Thad Wilson Jazz orchestra, sure. okay. Was that after you came back, or was that during no, the? No, that was so. That was the jazz orchestra was kind of off and on. That was when I first. So, yeah. Kenny gave me my first gig at uh-huh. at One Step Down in 1997, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then um, by going to HR 57, you know, meeting all the cats, yeah. um, I met Thad and I met Fred Foss, etc. And um, there was this talk of this all black big band. There was mm-hmm. always this talk of this all black big band. And so mm-hmm. there was this, you know, if you remember before it was the Thad Wilson Jazz Orchestra, it was kind of like this all black, yeah. Yeah. you know, big band thing. Mm-hmm. And it was this talk of the, like, just having this thing where we can just be in this space and share and create. And then um, Thad got the gig at One Step Down. Yeah. So then it became the Thad Wilson yeah. Jazz Orchestra with him getting the gig is under his name, et cetera. And so the beautiful thing about that was that every Monday night, it was all of these cats yeah. playing. And in it that- It wasn't all black though. No, no, it wasn't, no. No, it, of course, you know. No, but it was a beautiful thing of like, um, being next to Greg at first, right? Greg and Boyer. You, Greg Boyer, yeah. and then like, okay, this is how Greg is playing, and how do I figure out how I fit into this thing? Yeah. Still find a way to express myself, mm-hmm. I'm like, 2021, no, yeah. 21, 22. Yeah. You know, he's been in the scene for a while. Yeah. How do I figure out how to express myself within this thing mm-hmm. and not let that, his very um, personal approach yeah. pull me in, in one direction or the next, you know? And then, you know, all the cats in the saxophone section and hearing what you all were doing, the cats in the trumpet yeah. section, it was a great you know? Yeah. And I remember, you know, Don Vante, one time we, you know, at this time we do all these little gigs like HR 57 uh-huh. at Wednesday, mm-hmm. wherever. And Don Vati was like, hey man, you need to check out the bebop scale. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, let me check out the bebop <laughs> scale. You know? And um, I say it was all of those things. It was like this, there was for me, it was this environment to just again that creation. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, how yeah. Where? It definitely was a vibe. Yeah, and it, it was like ev- every Monday, um, um, you have this opportunity to like find your thing. And that was like early. The beginning of 1998 for a little period, right? Yeah. Just like every Monday night. Um, and it was crazy because there was all of this life stuff happening at the same time. Yeah. But it was like having this space to like go create yeah, was, while all of this craziness is going and then on. The in cat, life. We, we feeding off each yeah. other. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a beautiful thing, man. Andrew White would come down Andrew White, and check us out. Charlie Young, yeah, you know, some yeah. cats would come out from the news station. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for me, that band allowed. More of that, there was like that segue from the, that, the spirit I had in high school to now the spirit of like, I remember the Jamal was, we, we did a gig recently, Jamal Brown, and he was like, man, like early on, I remember you were like, almost like avant-garde kind of your approach to playing, <laughs> yeah. you know? And I said, you know, it was just what I was hearing at the time, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, and and it's great because by having those different outlets and those different experiences kind of give you different bags, yeah. you know. And then you and I were in this band called Black Notes. Yep, with yeah, yeah. The well, late that, our that brother was, that was Lasana. Late, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, that was a different vibe. Yeah, that was that was a whole other kind. Of, yeah, uh, Clif- Clifton Brockington. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Black Nose was. Um, yeah, was Clifton? Was Clifton? Or was just you and I was the horn? You were the horn. Yeah. Clifton was. Um, sometimes he would. I think early on he would sometimes play piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah, know, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then James, James, James McKinney. Yeah. And uh, David White. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, Lasana Mac, right? Yeah, Lasana Mac. Yeah, man, yeah. that was that was a good, that was a cultural kind of, you know, and you were getting, I, I know, the culture. You've always had the cultural yeah. thing, but that fit right in your yeah. In your it thing was right it there. was cool because you know I think, I think sometimes you know with 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 some things you know with a Pan African community, and um, just different types of of, of of organization within the Black community, um, sometimes. You have folks who, I, I I guess might wear the stuff, yeah. but not really be about the culture, yeah. and it it's it, it. I've always been impressed by folks where you're not sure what they're doing, you don't know how they're doing it, mm. but it's like when you read their, you know, biography, you read whatever, you start learning about yeah. all the stuff that they were involved in, the ways yeah. in which yeah. they were, and I've always been um, intrigued and. Um, inspired by that kind of yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Where you, you do the work and whether folks know you're doing the work or not, yeah. kind of did it. So being a part of Black Notes um, was instrumental to see like how Lasana was doing that. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, he was, he was, and, he was serious yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, just him bringing the, 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 yeah. the, 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 the Council of Elders together, yeah. him yeah. volunteering for stuff within the community, him mm-hmm. trying to create this 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 mm-hmm. very diverse group within Black Nose. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you think of all the different cats yeah. that yeah. were in there, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the music was, a, it was a, I mean, he had jazz to, mm-hmm. to hip hop. To, it was just, yeah. it was Black African, music. Yeah. <laughs> It was black. I mean, you just. I mean, wherever you're coming from with black music, it was right inside yeah. of black notes, you know. Wow. And then the varying levels of like, like you had cats that were really serious about music and cats were doing it for a hobby, but it was still yeah. a vibe. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it was beautiful, man. Yeah. So you ultimately you you end up uh, attending. You went to Berkeley High University. Mm-hmm. You went to. I read you went to Montgomery College. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You went to the Naval School of Music. Yeah. Uh, um. And you, you graduated from somewhere because you, yeah. you ended up getting your master. Where'd you yeah. get your, so, so, so you went, did you go to UDC as well? I did. I did go to UDC. Oh, wow. So, so I you, mean, you I, was at a Howard University. Yep, and yep. All and, of them. Yeah. All of them. All of them. I, I, you know, I could tell stories from each in, one. Yeah, I was in both. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so with, with, so, so, um, I guess, so, what was this? Um. So you know, in two thousand, I remarried, and then I, um, in two thousand five, uh, my son is coming into the world. Mm-hmm. So my son is coming into the world, and you know, I think it was what was that? What year was that? I think the two thousand. I forgot what semester that was, but it was the semester, the one semester. Let me get the. So 2005, I my son was getting ready to come into the world, and I was everything else was going good, and I, I'm at the hospital, and I called my 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 instructor. Um, everybody was cool; they knew what was going on, and I called my instructor and I said, "Look, I'm not gonna be able to make it in for my recital, right? I had a recital day that." Like it wow. was when he was supposed to come, it was you know a different yeah, time. Yeah. But the day he actually arrived, wow. I had my my wow. end of the semester recital. Yeah. So I called my, pri- my my instructor at the school. I was like, my son is coming to. I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it mm-hmm. to the thing. He was like, we figure out something, and then I got an F. Wow. Yeah. So this is it Howard. This is it Howard, uh-huh. right? So. Um, you know, this is after like some back and forth stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the professors weren't always aware and, of what's going on, but I try to do my best to communicate what was mm-hmm. happening. This particular time, yeah, everything is a school, all my classes, this one cat. So, um, I was also around that time, Eric McMillan calls me up, he said, man, I think DuPoy is about to leave. I think he's getting a, getting a job at another school. Who's this? Um, Duport. Duport, okay. right? Because he's the trombone yeah. instructor. I yeah. think he's getting ready to get a job at another school. Um, would you be interested in coming to teach at Duke? I was like, yeah, man, cool. 
So then whatever happened, that didn't pan out. And there was a lot of other things that didn't pan out. And I was like, man, I got two kids coming, you know, here. <laughs> and these gigs are not be able to cut it with, with yeah. what's going on. So I was already in the National Guard. So I was like, you know what? This stuff don't happen. I'm going active duty. So I went active duty, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, sign me up. So yeah. that sent me to the Naval School of Music because I was like, what band can I get into now? Yeah, yeah. And it was like, well, you know, you can do, there's a major command band. I want to know what band is no, close to, because no opens in the, in the specialty bands at mm -hmm. the time. And I'd already been to basic training. So I was like, okay, the next thing, the next best thing is the major command band. Is there one that's close? And I knew this cat named Albert Sanchez that was kind of like the band liaison, mm -hmm. you're right? So Albert was walking me through the stuff and he was like, there's a band in Fort Eustis, which is like somewhere in Virginia, like two hours away. But there's a band in Aberdeen that's an hour away. I said, okay, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> what do I need to do to get into that band? He said, well, you need to go to the School of Music. You need to get your Charlie, like a, a, a certain point, right? If you mm -hmm. get this high point on your, your concerto that you play, you know, mm -hmm. your, your exit audition, whatever. Anyway, I auditioned for the, the thing and coming in, I had a Charlie, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the, the, the score. And so I was like, okay. Um, so I'm at the School of Music, going through that side because they have their own School of Music. Mm -hmm. So I'm there, I'm playing through the stuff and I was like, you know, I need to get back to these kids. So let me, is there like a, 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 a early release kind of thing. So they had this special program, you could do acceleration program. Mm -hmm. So I got this really high score, I did acceleration program, and I was in at Aberdeen. It was supposed to be a six months thing. I was there at the School of Music for about three months. Wow. So I was at Aberdeen mm -hmm. within three months of, of deciding to go active duty. Wow. Right, so now I'm active duty, and so now because I'm active duty, obviously I can't do yeah. school full time. So I went through that process. In fact, while I was active duty, because of all the stuff that was going on, I got sick for a brief period of time. I developed this thing called vaso, mm -hmm. vagal syncope, where I was just passing out randomly. Wow. Um, and then um, from that commute, I even like got in this really bad accident where my car was totaled. Wow. Right? Yeah, I was just like, you know. But anyway, I did the- You passed out? I didn't pass out okay, at, okay. At, 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 you know, okay. I don't think I passed out, but I got in this really bad mm -hmm. accident. I mean, I don't, I don't even know, but okay. I, I yeah, it was a really yeah. bad accident. I, I walked out without any, uh, without a scratch, um, but my car was total. But anyway, I did the time with the military, and as soon as I finished, um, 2009, I went back to school. Dean's list next semester. What school did you go to? Howard. Okay, you right. Went I okay. went back to Howard, and I did 2009 at Howard, um, and then 2010 I was back at Howard, going through. But there's something that happened. So because I was active duty, I had what's called the post 9/11 GI Bill. This great thing where not only are they paying for school, but they're giving you a stipend every month. Okay. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's almost like you're still in. Yeah. But you have this, you getting paid. Yeah. To go to school, so they're paying for school and paying you. Anyway, I had this, this the first. I was trying to get stuff straightened out the first semester, 2009 semester. And someone in the financial aid, aid office dropped the ball wow. and they put down the wrong information. Oh, so wow. they wouldn't give me the credit for the post 9 11 JB. I was like, you all need to, wow. you have whatever. And I had documentation. So I was in this big fight and tussle with the, the provost yeah, and yeah, all of these yeah, folks wow. yeah. at the school. Long story short, there's that, that spring semester at Howard, I'm in a tussle with the financial aid department. I'm, um, performed with the 21st Century Band. Mm -hmm. And so we've done some tours. And I remember one, there was a couple of things that happened. One was, um, you know, still a communication thing. So I let the folks know what's going on. And we did this 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 music in the schools month thing at, um, at um, in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And on the way that we were heading back, I was scheduled to be back in time mm -hmm. to perform with the jazz ensemble for their, their spring thing. Mm -hmm. And I let Mr. Know, know what's going on, but life. So yeah. about to get in the plane, flight canceled. Wow. Flight canceled, blah, blah, blah. 
doesn't matter. You, st you know, it's on me, right? Yeah. So after these, the fight with the provost, the fact that I missed the, the thing, I was like, you know what? There's too much baggage back and forth with Howard mm -hmm. now with the financial aid department. They're messing up stuff, but I'm determined, right? Mm -hmm. Got these young kids, et cetera. So I was like, okay. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish at Howard, but let me do this. I can do all my core classes at Montgomery College. I can do all my undergraduate core classes that, that I didn't take at Berkeley, mm -hmm. I didn't take at Howard yet. And I'm gonna knock out all of those classes. So I'm gonna take the maximum amount of classes. What do I need to take for this, for, that mm -hmm. I, for, my, for my, my degree? So I took all of these classes, like probably a year period. The, the 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 military is paying for the post 911 GI Bill. I'm also getting money for school, mm. to pay for the classes. So I'm going taking these classes. I was going to school, going to school, going to school, going to school, and still doing mm. gigs. Right after I maxim took out all the max amount of classes that I need for the degree, I spoke with Miss Corey. I said, Miss Corey, I took these classes. What is it? How can I work this out at UDC? I got to UDC. Then I got there and then I, as we were going through the stuff, she was like, oh, well, they're saying you need to take this class. I said, no problem. I went straight, right? Spring, summer, fall. I knocked, knocked out the, 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 wow. the undergrad. And I was in like- In one year? In one year. Wow. Because I already had classes. Took all, yeah, right, yeah, I had I different you. classes, but I really knocked out all of my core classes at Montgomery College. So that fits in the Montgomery College piece. And then I took, I finished up my degree at UDC. Okay, wow. Right? Then right after I was like, I'm trying to go, Get my master's one time. Yeah, yeah. Right? So um, I had to explain certain things in my transcript, and I tell students about this as well, you know, especially that thing from the professor yeah. for my son. So yeah. I was like, wrote different schools a letter. I was like, look, this is the deal. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. When I'm trying to get my master's, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then so I, um, I, I was, again, with having kids, I was like, I'm trying to stay in the area. So, um, I was, was, was the best commute, it's not crazy. Uh, because right after I got my degree from um, um, UDC, Alvin called, it was like a professor pulled out. You know, they're not, they can't teach a course in Germantown. Are you available to teach a class in Germantown? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, <laughs> right? So then the cat from Germantown, uh, Montgomery College, called me up. It was like, here's the thing. Here's a syllabus. This is, what you, this is a subject. So I was like, I don't know half of this information. I was like, send me the book. I'm going to learn it. So I'm now <laughs> studying this, this stuff about this history class so yeah. I can teach this class. And it's an accelerated class. So you know you don't, you don't have the luxury of like, it yeah. happens on Monday, it yeah, happens yeah. on Wednesday, it yeah, happens yeah. on Friday. It's like every night, yeah. wow. Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday, hours at length. I need to know this information. Yeah, yeah. Let me design this class real quick mm -hmm. while I'm doing this stuff. So as, I'm, as I begin my career teaching at Montgomery College, I start my master's degree program at the University of Maryland. Wow. Right? College so, part? College part, okay. right? And so I'm now playing with the ensemble, I'm going through the, the program, and I'm teaching at Montgomery College. Mm -hmm. And so that's how those different schools wow. got in there. Man, woo. So, <laughs> um, I know you've educated, you have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a philosophy in education? Sure, I, I think, I think, you know, and I, you know, I've, I've spoken with Mr. Yarbrough this, about this as well. I think the idea is that you have to be flexible, you know what I mean? It's like, you could come in with a list. It's like you're showing up to the bandstand with a set list. Like, oh man, we're gonna play these tunes. Mm -hmm. And you get there and you feel a sense, you sense a vibe in the room, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, okay, you have to be flexible and resourceful. And so like, what do they need in this room right now? Mm -hmm. And be flexible enough to give them what they need, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so yes, you can have a lesson plan or a lesson idea and have it all written out, but then be flexible enough to say, okay, here's the situation, and then I need to like shift this way or shift that yeah, way yeah, yeah. to make sure that they they get the lesson, yeah. but they get it in a way that's best for them. Gotcha. Yeah. So you you as an educator, you are the director of jazz studies at Duke Ellington. Yes. School of the Arts. Yeah. Uh, 
a professor of music at Montgomery College, mm -hmm. Prince George's Community College, mm -hmm. and a teaching artist with the Washington Performing Arts Society. Mm -hmm. You see why I call you the hardest working <laughs> man in music and jazz? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's, let's get on. I want to learn a little bit, and we're going to go through this piece. Mm -hmm. I want to learn a little bit. Now, you call yourself a music activist. Yes. Um, how do you express your activism through music? Sure. So I, I think, like, so from, from a young age, I, I learned about the queer bear music. So mm -hmm. many of those songs, those folk songs, and folk music in many communities, they deal with some kind of historical event or teaching some type of lesson. Mm -hmm. And for a long period of time, the stuff that I, I, that I was interested in with activism, the music was kind of separate, you know what I mean? Cherokee's not dealing with activism, mm -hmm. you know, learn how to play rhythm changes or whatever. Yeah. It's not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so at some point, what happened is that those two things came together. It's like, mm -hmm. instead of keeping these things separate, let's find a way to where you can talk about things that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and use music to express those yeah. things, you know? And I think it, it, it's a powerful way of, of spreading the message. It's like, uh, if you have a song and there's an event going on, and then in that song you can talk about the mm -hmm. events that's going on, mm -hmm. is another way to bring light to that situation. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Um, and uh, you are like the trombone. Mm -hmm. You know, is not the traditional leader instrument. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, you do have you know you know mm -hmm. you have different cats. Uh, uh, but it's it's usually in the context of an ensemble, mm -hmm. and that's what it, in the jazz context, mm -hmm. okay. But you have been able to successfully position yourself and make the trombone a leader instrument. Mm -hmm. Was that a process, or was that an intent? Or yeah, it uh, was. It was a combination of, of 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 a lot of different things. So at first, it was necessity, right? So mm -hmm. in 1998. Um, 1997, 1998, one of the things I quickly learned was that um, being able to play the instrument, being able to do gigs, et cetera, um, uh, one, wasn't enough. And then two, because the nature of the instrument is not always called for different things. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so for me to be able to work as a musician, I had to, I had to also create my own opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I had to book gigs. I had to be yeah. leading gigs so that way I can balance between the gigs that I'm called for and the gigs that I'm creating. Yeah. And you know? I, I watch you do that. You know? And, you, and you've been real strong in the business of music. Mm -hmm. And very, you know, I, I like, I admire that about you. Um, thank you, thank um, you. Um, yeah, very, like, okay, I got to take care to make sure the business is yeah. cool. Yeah, so. You know, so, it's, yeah, yeah, so it's, it was like, so 1998, I was like, yes, I have to, you know, because again, if you go back to the tradition of music, it's like even though the trombone was there from the Kid Ori days, you know, mm -hmm. with the tailgate and the trombone was there, but it's it's like all right, just hold your space, you yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The trumpet, you know, exactly, you know, saxophone, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, before the saxophone and clarinet, but you kind of, you know, you hold your space. In the 1930s, similar thing. In the 1940s, less trombonist, but mm -hmm. still around. In 1950s, you're part of the ensemble, but if we need to, and I really learned this lesson from Steve Torres, that if we need to, if we have a budget issue, our Blakey will cut the trombone chair. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so yeah, it's yeah. like, just knowing the history of the music, yeah, I was yeah. like, you have the condition in one, like yeah. where you, you, if you think of, you know, the Cold Trains and the Miles Davis and mm -hmm. the Freddie Hubbards, there's certain instruments, yeah. the Winton Kellys, the Red Garlands, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not many folks think about Curtis Fuller or Ginger yeah. Johnson, yeah. unless they are real fan of the music, yeah. Yeah. you know, or the Slide Hampton, even if yeah. Slide Hampton's arranging and yeah. whatever. And so knowing that, as I knew right away that one, I wasn't willing to do a gimmick. Because sometimes trombone players have some kind of gimmick. I'm only, mm -hmm. I'm gonna play the trombone, I'm gonna do backflips. I'm gonna play the trombone, <laughs> but I'm just such, such. You know what I mean? And I didn't wanna do that, but also I wanted to know that how do I do this thing as a leader? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned was is you have to build your support system. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and it was a great thing I, I, I used to notice that Michael Thomas used to do. He would have these little cards and, cards and tables, mm -hmm. right? Having collected yeah, people yeah. to dress. 
So I became real aggressive with that. Yeah. I'd be on the train. I see somebody, somebody will see me and we spark a conversation and I'd be having, having my instrument. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm into jazz, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Join the mailing list. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So, I, you know, and then when social media was fresh and new and folks were kind of using it mm -hmm. in an effective way, I would like gather yeah. folks through that as well, you know? Yeah. So, so just you, in technology really. Technology you, yeah, and, yeah. And, and just using these tools to build a support yeah. system wow. um, became equally important for me. But then not just building a support system, but then also making sure that when I perform, that every time I'm, I need to be better. Gotcha. You know what I mean? I need yeah. to be growing. So it's not, I'm not just building a support system I'm up there playing garbage, but I'm building a support system, but I'm also making sure that yeah. they come and the band is rehearsed, da, 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 da. You know what I mean? Did that, did that also necess necessitate you to become a composer? Or were you doing that already? I was doing that already. I mean, and the composing things kind of like happen naturally over time, uh -huh. you know. Um, it, it's a, a funny story is like, as a kid, my mom would be cleaning and making up making up songs mm. as she's cleaning the mm -hmm. house, right? So I always heard her like making up all these random songs about whatever, <laughs> cleaning the house, cooking food. We mm. had the beach, she's making up songs. Yeah. So I had this thing of just like, just creating melodies. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was another way of of, of expression of saying, um, you have these thoughts, feelings, emotions, and how can I bring those things to life? You yeah. know, and so composing was something that I became passionate about early on. Wow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You have uh, six recordings mm -hmm. under your name, mm -hmm. and uh, your recordings you can hear the sounds of calypso, reggae and other African-influenced genres, mm -hmm. which now gives your music a unique flavor. And, and a lot of that stuff is original. Mm -hmm. um, 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 each of your recordings have a some kind of message. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this goes to your activism. Mm -hmm. um, let's briefly talk about the concept behind each recording, sure. starting with Freedom's Children, which came out in 2011. Mm -hmm. So Freedom's Children um, was kind of off the back of, uh, it was, it was, so there was, there was this initiative I was a part of in 2010 called the VI Movement for Change. Mm -hmm. And the VI Movement for Change was basically saying, okay, there's all these different organizations that are working for social change. Let's find a way to bring them together. Let's use, let's say you are a mathematician or you are a um, musician or whatever to your skills are, let's use those skills and go into the schools and speak to students and try to inspire students to, do, to, to create positive change. Because at this time, um, there was a lot of increase in violence within the Virgin mm -hmm. Islands. And during that initiative, I received a lot of pushback. You know, um, I remember um, I was, uh, I, you know, um, I go into as many deeds as I can, right? Mm -hmm. And so I we'll remember, be brief. We go yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I was in this, I was in this situation where I was doing these, these, these speeches at schools and talking with kids, just doing this positive stuff. And this, this person they didn't like what I was doing, so they went to speak with somebody else and create a, a bad situation for you know some other things I was involved with. So there was a lot of pushback for me, mm -hmm. for me doing this talking and 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 going out into the schools and and mm -hmm. and, and speaking about social justice issues. So, Freedom's Children was the beginning of me saying, um, I'm going to use music. Watch. I'm gonna yeah, focus yeah, in yeah. solely on music and make sure that my messaging is clear in all the things that I'm passionate about, but no one else is involved in, mm -hmm. in the creation of this gotcha. music, right? And so Freedom's Children, um, the Children's Parade deals with, the first song deals with, you know, um, growing up in the music, um, you know, relaxing and Sankofa deep these with reclaiming with yours. But when we get to peace and love, there can't be peace without justice. That's more specific to some of the stuff that's yeah. going on. And so there's like, you know, with yeah. each album I write the liner notes and I talk about, you know, the yeah. meaning behind the music. Okay, you yeah. got the Love album in 2013. Yeah. Just briefly. Yeah, yeah, give sure. Me, what are we talking about love? So, <laughs> so love, the, the Love album deals with self-respect and, and self-love. There's kind of a couple things. One is the idea of, of the the social justice messenger, the fact that some people have, you know, 
issues with, with being able to just deal with self-love and self-respect. Mm -hmm. But then also around the time as I was creating that album, uh, my younger sister was going through some some mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? And so it was like this duality between the social justice element and then also like a message to her as well wow, at the same beautiful. time. Yeah. Right. Uh, after that, you had Elements of Life, 2014. Mm -hmm. Elements of Life is kind of like the, uh, the, the environment, okay. you know, and then, the, of course, the human spirit. So you have elements within us that... Um, Earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and if those elements are off, are off balance, you know, uh -huh. we don't, we don't, you know, I mean, if there's one element within us is that, that it's not, it's receiving too much energy or not enough, yeah. we're, like, we're not in, in sync. And so it's the same thing with the, the planet. Like yeah. if we're not taking care of certain things, if, mm -hmm. if we pollute the water, we pollute the air, mm -hmm. you know, stuff kind of go haywire. So that's yeah. kind of what the album deals with. Okay. Then that was followed in 2015 by Spiritual Awakening. So Spiritual Awakening was kind of like the process that you go through when you become aware. You know, So the first thing you have this awakening, this awareness of like there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And then what's the problem? How do you deal with a problem? You know, when it said there's a social justice issue, it's like, okay, there's corruption, there's racism, there's whatever. There's awareness of it, and then the process of finally getting to the point where you um, you can rejoice because you accomplished your mission. Gotcha. You know, in 2019, you released "Rise of the Protester." Rise of the Protester. You know, sometimes with some of the albums, folks don't necessarily know what they mean. Rise of the Protester was to be as direct as possible, okay. right? Like you can have no. You know, there's no question in your mind what this album is okay. about, right? <laughs> and so it deals with not only activists throughout, you know, or protesters or different ways in which, for example, Araminta was written for Harriet Tubman, D Duvernay's direction for Ava Duvernay using her camera mm -hmm. as a way, um, using film as a way to deal with social justice issues, ta Coates mm -hmm. using his pen, you know, Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have um, the idea of protesting, so like the song No Justice, No Peace, there's like chants in there, like the act, actual thing, the way the song ends it with people saying, no justice, no peace, no justice. So the wow. rhythm of yeah, the melody yeah. deals yeah. with some of that, right? So it was just dealing with just, um, not the climate, not only the climate of the country at the time, but the idea of that, you know, throughout the history of this country, how black people have found a way to protest and rebel against social justice issues. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, that was followed in two, 2020 by Healing, mm -hmm. the album Healing. So the healing, so the one I recorded last year, that one was, um, it's kind of a combination of different things. One was the idea, when I wrote the pieces, was kind of dealing with, 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 with the healing, again, going in and dealing with healing and just the elements of healing or interpersonal relationships, the fact that, you know, forgiveness and communication mm -hmm. and, 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 and um, appreciation, those things. Even think about Lasana ending conversation with I appreciate you, yeah. you know, so those ideas of, of what what the healing process entails, mm -hmm. but then then as I was preparing for recording the album, the pandemic was going on. Wow. So when I composed the music was before the pandemic, but the pandemic was going on, and then just seeing how different folks were getting sick, and mm -hmm. and just you know how not even with getting sick, but just how kids were processing the yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I it, it, like for example in some of my classes, I remember students just not showing up. Or not be or showing up, but just not present, you know. Yeah. Wow. And one of the things I try to help them to cope with it was to take a, a story of my own. I said, you know, when I when I got to high school, the hurricane hit in mm -hmm. 1989, and um, it was like this was my first time in high school. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was trying to help my my sons as well because my sons are in high school, yeah. wow. you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, the hurricane hit, and everything shut down. In fact, you know, I was like. A freshman in high school, there was this new girl I was interested in, <laughs> right? As soon as the hurricane hit, the 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 communication stopped wow. completely, yeah. right? So I was like, oh man, I can't even talk yeah, with a girl, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was you know, at first it was like, I didn't feel like practicing. I didn't feel like doing nothing. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. everything is destroyed. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm a, a freshman in high school. But it was a couple of things that helped. And I said, I told the students one was music, being able to practice and just let mm -hmm. that thing come through the music, but then also dancing, you know, being that, that fact I was into hip hop dancing. And in high school, I was- You know like, how to dance? Yeah, I was, you know, <laughs> in, in, in 10th grade, me and my um, 
you know, we had a crew and we actually really? won. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I was I was like serious about that. The so, pop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. From 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 break dancing <laughs> to hip hop dancing wow. like Heavy D and the yeah. Boys. Wow. You know, like how we transcribe. Yeah, yeah. I used to transcribe for videos. Wow. I watch the videos and let's say I'm watching. Kwame doing a move or uh, uh, Big Daddy King, yeah. he Heavy Day and the Boys, <laughs> EPMD. All those videos had like all of this information of dance wow. moves. Yeah, and um, wow. I would like take all those moves and use them. So we we had like this seventeen under dance club that we would go to, and me and my boy would be there like doing us. You know, something you watch yeah. those, yeah. like you know, like uh, what's that house party? You yeah. know, like yeah. in the and the, yeah. the, the, the people like move out the way and people yeah. like dancing in the yeah. middle. Yeah. I was being me and my my my, my crew. We be doing that <laughs> wow, stuff, you know. Yes, sir. So what we did during after Hurricane Hugo happened, we started a little dance class in my in my parents' driveway. Mm. So we invited the kids from the neighborhood, and we taught them how to do the Running Man and how to jump through their legs. Wow. And so we had this little you know battery. We would go to the store, buy batteries, mm -hmm. and put it in a boombox, and just have this yeah, hip hop yeah, playing yeah, yeah. and teaching them dance moves. So I was telling the students that you know even if this is a um, a, a, a terrible situation, find a way um, to use your skills to, to, yeah. to process all that's going on. And so now that I'm preparing for the album, all that stuff was in my mind. You wow. know, like how people are, different types of healing, of how folks are processing this stuff with the pandemic, yeah. how students are processing and stuff, how I process stuff mm -hmm. when I was a kid, and then all of that stuff went into creating the album. Wow. Well, you create, you created quite the legacy, young man. Well, thank you. <laughs> and another thing that uh, I like, do you use that same artist for all, you, you have some interesting yes. pictures, man, yes. on each of your, mm -hmm. on each of your uh, yeah. recordings, man. Yeah, you know, you know, sometimes people talk about, I try to use the same musicians uh -huh. and I try to use, and I've, I've used the same artists, you know, so it's been pretty much for the most part, the same musicians, there've been some yeah. changes, yeah. you know, fit, Speak, the fit yeah. messages. Yes. Um, but I think it's important when you consistency, you, yeah, yeah, consistency. Yeah. Then also building a vibe. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you put all the album covers together, you can see this yeah, continuation. Yeah, yeah. You can see, and in yeah. fact, deliberately, because the process is my seven artists meet Ricardo, um, and we talk about the album cover. Sometimes I send him his sketches. Sometimes I just describe yeah. what, what, what what I'm looking mm -hmm. for, um, and we go back and forth. Was the yeah. message of music, and there's, there's, there's. If you look at Freedom Children, you see the doves, yeah, yeah. And you see, yeah. the, you know, the water. If you look at Love, mm -hmm. you see the water in some of the letters, yeah, yeah. Right. If you look at Elements of Life, then you see like a different, yeah, yeah. Take on this same yeah. image. Then if you look at um, Spiritual Awakening, it's like this horizon. Yeah. So it's then you see yeah. um, with the the the. Um, Rise of the protesters, the tears coming out of the eyes, going into the pool, mm. and then. That mm -hmm. same dove is somewhere in there. And then on the healing album, this elder is holding wow. that bird. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he's yeah. like, there's all of this, this, this. And then in, in some of the albums, there are little symbols of, of, of you yeah. know, sometimes a decor symbol, sometimes other type of yeah. symbolism mm -hmm. that mess with, like in the love, I mean, in the Rise of the Protester album, there's the images in the in the pool, it's all the different things that people are protesting. So wow. they're holding up different signs wow. and stuff, you know. Beautiful, man. So yeah. Wow, man. That's 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 beautiful. Um and just just your band. Let's give them some the mm -hmm. band members in your band. Let's give them some love. Yeah, yeah. Who who are the members of your uh No, so the current members are uh, Lenny Robinson, mm -hmm. um Brian Settles, uh, Saxophone. saxophones, uh Herman Bernie, bass. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes Alan Johnson because we do a, a piano less thing, yeah. and myself. Starting off, it was um, I mean Gums, Victor Provost, Roman Bernie, mm -hmm. and myself. So we first I, I I went with that vibe. Then it changed over a little bit with Alan. Even before recording, we had a a, a different thing because remember we did that thing at HR fifty seven yeah, with yeah. that large ensemble. Yeah. So there's been different configurations over the time. But as far as since recording, it's been, um, at first it was like steel pan, trombone, bass and drums. Mm -hmm. Then, and and um, then um, I would bring in different players to, to deal with certain um, things. Um, in 2016, then it changed over to Lenny and drums. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to record a different album because we did a series of tours. Hope played piano for a while with the group. Mm -hmm. um, 
In fact, one of the albums we were supposed to record um, um, didn't happen, but we was trying to do a live album. Okay. Hope was, was playing piano for some of that. Uh, but yeah, I, I've tried to keep, you know, the same members. Christy was part of the group for mm -hmm. a while. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes members change because of schedules, you yeah. know, et cetera, oh, yeah. et cetera. Oh, yeah. You know, um, but I always, I always feel it's important to use the same music so you yeah. can develop a vibe, yeah. a consistency, you know. Yep. Syn you know? Synergy. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. So we're going to move along. We're, we're approaching the end. Oh, uh, no problem. But I just want to share, uh, you have appeared on many recordings from jazz to hip hop. Mm -hmm. You perform with such luminaries as a Mary Baraka, mm -hmm. mm, Dr. Billy Taylor, Illinois Jaquette. Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, mm -hmm. Dion Parson and the 21st Century Band, Ron Blake, Mark Carey, Joe Chambers, Cyrus Chestnut, George Duke, Benny Golson, Wycliffe Gordon, Sean Jones, Jason Moran, Johnny O'Neill, Nicholas Payton, Vanessa Rubin, Terrell Stafford, mm -hmm. Gary Thomas, Tim Warfield, mm -hmm. my man, Larry Willis, and many other extraordinary artists. And I'm gonna throw my name in there. Antonio That's right. Parker. Antonio Parker. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. you you we done some recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 I just, that was you know. Yeah. <laughs> Final questions. Mm -hmm. Um. First of all, how's the family? Everyone is doing well. You have yeah. give your kids. You have two, three kids. right? Three kids. Yeah, yeah. Give them names and uh, you have. Well, you know, I. Oh, you know. Yeah. yeah so you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, you know. I, um. So it's like everything. Else with, with me and and the performing is great, but as you notice, I don't keep any Facebook okay. pictures, you know. Yeah, and yeah. there's a reason for that. I mean, yeah. early on, um, as I was building a mailing list, you know, sometimes you get crazy folks. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and so I made a conscious decision to keep Kids. The, keep okay. yeah keep them you know that's yeah. like you know I have a family, but yeah. you you know yeah. got gotcha. you okay you know unless we you know we close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, you know, I got you. Yeah, you know, but okay. no, you're not going to be searching up people. Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, man. No, I hear you, man. Yeah, man. I mean, and, 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 and folks, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I you know, you could talk about some stuff yeah, offline, yeah, but yeah. you know. That's you know, cool. I understand. You know, so, you know. where has it been like being a father? It's been you. great. It's been great. Okay. I mean, it's it's been. Um, Your kids have been around the music. You, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. mean, I remember early on them coming to gigs. I remember, you know, early so some gigs, gigs at JoJo's, where the boys on my lap, yeah, when I'm playing, you know, and I, yeah. you know, coming out to rehearsals, you know, in I, in I, fact, when I was getting my 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 last two years getting my master's, so my master's degree, you know, two years process. Them coming to me to history classes or coming to me yeah. with, with me yeah. to um, you know pick them up from school and come on we we we're going to class. So you so know? are they into the music? They, you know, yeah, you know, and 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 that was important for me for me for them if they decided to and they tried it out. You know, my sons play trumpet. My daughter is, is talking about playing guitar now or something, but it it was the idea was is was like. If they wanted to do it, cool, but do your own thing. Like my, for, for example, and I tell my sons this all the time, my father fixed radios and television, right? And so he taught me how to do it. I remember when I was a kid, I, one of my boom boxes, he showed me how to take it apart and fix certain things mm -hmm. in there, take apart the VCR, how to mm -hmm. clean the heads, et cetera. And so those skills stuck with me. I didn't decide to go engineer or yeah, you know, yeah, go yeah, into yeah, repair, yeah, yeah. but now you know, something happens in the house, be like, okay, let me take this thing <laughs> apart, and you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so those skills stuck with me, even like with 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 um, with dealing with sound and microphones and stuff. Like my father was into that kind of thing, yeah. so I had those skills available to mm -hmm. me, but it wasn't something I wanted to go into. Gotcha. So I told the boys, I said, you know, you know, you will learn if you want to, but you you know, don't feel pressure to go into this thing. You okay. know. Yeah. Okay. What's next for Reginald Cinchi? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I think right now is continue is is these the 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 same two paths because I started, I started playing music at twelve and I started teaching music at fifteen, you mm -hmm. know. So education or being an educator and being a performer has yeah. always been, you know. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I invested so much time into performing is because 
I realized early on that I, I needed to give my students something. I didn't want to they get to a certain point like, okay, I learned to play my skills, now I need to move on. Gotcha. I didn't want to be one of those teachers. I wanted to be a teacher that, as long as you want to study with me, there's a lot of information I have that I could pass on, or I can direct you to someone that can mm -hmm. help you out. You know, um, and So I started teaching at the age of 15 and developed that passion. So I, would, I, I want to continue building the two, you know, yeah. building the performance side and building the education. I remember you had a school that you yeah. started. I still, you I still, still have, I still have was, it. So uh, Jagna School of Music? Jagna? Yeah. yeah Jagna yeah. School of Music, yeah. What inspired that? Um, Your passion for education? Yeah, so like, you know, I, I, you know, I, earlier on, I talked about, there was always this passion of, of creating. So I went to Interlochen as a, as a, um, in, uh, after 10th grade. Uh, for a summer program in 91. And when I got there, I was like, man, this would be perfect in the Caribbean. It's too cold in, in Michigan. Yeah. I was imagine this art school mm -hmm. in the Virgin Islands, right? Where you have, you know, self-sustained school. And in fact, one of my chemistry classes I took, chemistry and the environment, we had to do a project. And, and in that project, I wrote this proposal about this self-sustained art school where you know, they're growing their own food and, you know, mm. there's, there's all this stuff is like just inside the school, right? Where the students come there and it's just like in this environment. And I was thinking, man, this would be a great thing for tourism. This would be a great thing for the yeah. community, mm -hmm. you know? It might be a somewhat of a dream because you have all of these music programs at all the schools. Yeah. I was, you know, I was kind of hesitant about it because I didn't want to create a situation where you have all the students in the music, in that into music, leave and go to this art school and mm -hmm. then the, the regular high schools are suffering yeah. or the regular, you know. Yeah. But I always envision of, 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 of having an art school. So that was one of my early goals. Um, and then of course, you know, playing and performing. Yeah. Um, but so I started teaching at a young age and then I've been teaching ever since and just learning as much as I can so yeah. I can pass yeah. something on in the classroom. Beautiful, man. Yeah. So, Last question. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a question, but tell the people how they can get in contact with you, and uh, uh, you know if they want to hire you. How sure. can they reach? You can look sure. right in the camera. So my name is Reginald Sinchi. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, you can find my website reginaldsinchi.com. I'm all over social media, so you can find me on Facebook. Um, I have a personal Facebook page or, or artist page. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram for those of you are, you know, dealing with business, you know, stash companies. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Or you could just search me on Google and just see whatever comes up. You know, I have a YouTube page and, you know, my music is all over um, on all the streaming platforms. But, you know, please make sure you purchase music for, for musicians versus streaming. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Well, my brother, I want to thank you. Um, for sharing your story with us. Oh, man. man. We, Thank you, man. Appreciate lot. you. Yeah, we learned a lot about you, man. Uh, you have an interesting story, man. I mean, and, uh, you know, at some point, you probably need to put it in a book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I, thought, I thought about it. You know, I, I, I think, you know, um, you know, with, I'm always writing. I used to have this blog, man, where I used to just write stuff almost every day. In fact, when I was in the military, mm -hmm. um, because of how the music is 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 played in the military, mm -hmm. it, the music didn't become wasn't an outlet for me anymore mm -hmm. in the military. So I started writing. So I had this blog that I used to keep all of this stuff. But then again, that created another problem because then with the blog and writing all kind of stuff, then you yeah. you, you attract different type of yeah. type of folks. Yeah. And so eventually, because all those folks that started coming to the blog, I was like, nah, I need to take this thing off. You wow. know. So I still have all of those things that I yeah. wrote about activism, about about you know. Thoughts, poetry, etc. You yeah, know, yeah, all but, the stuff is ready. So maybe uh, yeah. sometime in the future. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, thank you again, brother. We look and we'll look. We'll look out for that. Thank you know. You. Um, uh, uh, thank you again. We appreciate you. Appreciate you for uh, sharing your story here on a conversation in jazz. Thank you for having me. Yes, appreciate sir. You, yeah, man. no doubt. So there it is, the one and only Mr. Reginald Cinchi. <laughs> <laughs> this is a conversation in jazz. And we'll see you on the next one.